Good morning, everyone. Grab a seat. Uh, thanks for coming and being so prompt. This is one of the few events uh, slated to start at 9am I've ever been to that actually starts at 9am. So props to you for being prompt. My name's James O'Loughlin. Welcome to the Future of Construction Forum. I'll be UMC uh, this morning and just briefly to... I'll just explain who I am because... So I used to do the new inventors on the ABC and done a lot of work on ABC radio. And I just wanted to mention that quickly because, because I've been on TV, people often recognise me, but because TV is not very important and getting less so, they usually don't know where they recognise me from. So I was out there getting a croissant and someone came up and said, G'day! And I said, G'day! And then they just went, ah. <laughs> That's what they said. They said, ah. Did we go to school together? Um, and that happens to me all the time. I, I live in Sydney. I live in Bondi, which is fantastic, you know, in summer because you can park in Marrickville. Um, I'm one of the few people that's, you know, glad that winter, winter is coming. Today's going to be a really interesting day. I, you know, there's been so much change, hasn't there, in the last 50 years, the last 25 years, even the last 10 years. You, you get to... You kind of cope with it all and you get your business in a state where you're dealing with it all. It's kind of tempting in um, May 2019 to say, okay, thank God we've done it. We're here. But of course, just because there's been a lot of change in the past doesn't mean we've, we've arrived. The journey continues and that change will continue uh, in your industry, in fact, in all industries through... Uh, uh, through society, and it's going to be driven, I guess, at the moment by the Internet of Things, by big data, by in, in, uh, increased connectivity, and also by the next thing that we don't, e we don't even know what it is yet. Of course, artificial intelligence and robotics have big roles, but there'll be other things too that we can't even imagine, just as those 20, 30 years ago couldn't imagine the changes that we were about uh, about to see. So the solution, of course, is never to think that you've arrived. It's to always be open to the next, uh, the next better way of doing things, to, to not accepting that the way you do things now, even if it's really good, is going to be good enough in 2022 or 2025. And what we really want to talk about today, and there's some great speakers with some very interesting and different perspectives on this, is different ways in which your industry, industry might change, and more importantly, the things you can do to get ready for and take advantage of those, of those changes. We often see change as a as a threat, as a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And what we really want to do is to be able to surf the wave of change rather than be dumped by it. And that's one of the things that we hope this morning will set you up to be able to do. I mean, you guys, you know, I'm always amazed by the things the construction industry does. And so much of it is taken for granted. So many people in the industry are sort of quiet achievers, the very opposite from the industry I come from, the media entertainment industry, where people are generally loud, not achievers. Um, uh, but so much incredible work is done in this industry, and, and the challenge is to work out how to do it even better. So that's a good, a good challenge to have. It, it's about technology, but it's not just about technology. It's about how well we use that technology, how smart we are in deploying it. An example, we had a restaurant recently and the waiter took our order by iPad, right? And that's happening now. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you can tell it was a bit new because he was sort of navigating his way. To be honest, it probably took a little bit longer than writing it down, but I was, you know, I'm very interested in innovation. I was kind of keen to see how their new iPad waiter ordering system worked. So I watched him as he left the table after swiping our order and he walked over to the kitchen, calls out to the chef, the chef grabs a little scrap of paper and a pen and he just reads the order off the iPad. So it's not just about technology, it's about, it's about how well we use it, how clever we are in using it. Uh, toilets are through there and up the stairs. Um, Wi-Fi, you'll see the details um, come up on a slide with a very tricky password. So um, 
Uh, that'll, that'll only be up there for another 30 seconds, so write it down or type it in. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to go till about 10.30, then we'll have a, uh, a, a, a generous break with um, food and and uh, hot drinks, then we'll be back at about 11. Uh, at 11.30, there'll be a panel discussion, so the speakers won't take questions on the way, but then they'll all come back at 11.30 for about a half-hour panel discussion. Uh, we're basically fueled by your questions, so if you do have questions that ri arise along the way, write them down, and there will be an opportunity to ask them. So, let us get into it. Our first speaker is Andrew Hill. Andrew Hill is the business manager for Cloud A2K. He's got experience in architectural, engineering, and construction software. He's got a great ability to connect broad industry issues to specific practical solutions. He's lectured at university and technical college in engineering, run design teams for large consulting engineering companies. And today, he's going to talk about, about change uh, map some of the big patterns of change and explain how that applies to the construction industry and the change it's going through right now. We'll see a short video and then the person that appears on stage won't be me, it'll be Andrew. So when the video change, uh, ends, you know, welcome him in the traditional way. All right, here's the video. <laughs> Thank you everybody for attending. Um, really, really happy to see a full room today. So, and it's a really important topic for everybody because the industry is changing and it's evolving. And we think that we've seen substantial change. We think that we've seen new ways of working, but really we're just on the cusp of change and what that means. So the, a big focus for us today is gonna be that. It's change innovation and it's what does that mean to the industry and how did we get to where we are today. One of my favourite comments and it's interesting that it was actually brought up at the World Economic Forum as well. This isn't Justin's comment but it's one that I've seen used a number of times. The pace of change has never been this fast but will never be this slow again. And it's important for us to understand that, that as much as we believe the industry is changing and as much as we've been through to set ourselves up, we are nowhere near where we need to be or where we will be in the next 50 years. And it's interesting when we go and look back at the industrial revolutions that's brought us to where we are today. We have four, so we're in the fourth industrial revolution. Getting faster each time, so it'll be interesting. We're already talking about Industry 5.0, um, a lot of talk about it at the moment. We started off with Industry 1. So 
the area of mechanisation, taking steam, taking water, and actually being able to drive machinery for the first time, led us to being able to factorise the way that we work and actually then start to put things into a more productive environment rather than straight manual labour. We then move through to the area of electrification. Suddenly, everything that we had produced became portable because we had power. And power enabled us to move things around, to start positioning them, and start really talking about production line. How we move from here to the next item, to the next item, and the next. And that really changed, especially the automotive industry, with the way that they actually went through and started streamlining how they worked, um, how they looked at, a, at the production of a car from concept to putting it together. But then we moved through to the third industrial revolution. Probably the one of us that a number in this room, not everybody, I know there's probably a lot of millennials, but a number of the, in this room grew up with, the area of automation taking robotics, taking computer logic, and actually being able to put that into our day-to-day -day work, being able to actually understand that no longer were we tied by what a machine could do, but we were tied by the logic that could be tied to that machine to perform a task. It all led to automation. So, and in our industry, it's something that we haven't been good at. How can we remove tasks from what we do? How can we automate? Because really, we've been very focused on, this is what a building's going to look like. This is what we're going to put together. This is an infrastructure project. And then how do we get it built? We get a lot of labour and a lot of equipment, and then we drive it. So we haven't really automated the way we produce as soon as we moved into construction. And it's one of the areas where there's been a very big difference between manufacturing and uh, construction, and I'll talk about that a bit later. And then we move into the era of Industry 4.0 and an era of networking. A lot of people say that this Industry 4.0 is very new. It was actually 2011, I think, roughly, um, the official start date of Industry 4.0. But it's now really about data. It's around capturing data and being able to use that and use that to make the decisions for us because that's what becomes critical to each and every one of us on the work site. It's not how we automate now, through a robot, it's how we teach a robot to be smarter. It's how we teach it through logic, through understanding, through decisions that we've previously made so that we don't bring our mindset of what is possible, the computer can understand what's possible for us. And to understand this a little bit better, as I said, Industry 3.0 drove massive change. First microprocessor, what an invention. We went from having a building half the size of this running a computer to being able to have it on our desktop, to being able to take it home. Microprocessors shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, got faster and faster and faster. And that drove us to innovation where we now, everybody in this room I would say, would have a laptop, a computer, not just at work, that at home, for the kids, for everybody else. So that led us into the era of computers, which led us into the era of CAD. And CAD was a massive evolution for us as well. Suddenly, we could lose the manual process of drawing and produce that now on a computer. What did that do to the industry? Well, it actually changed the way we thought because it changed us from the thinking of I need to get it right, or it's going to take a lot of work for me to fix it, to I can now use this design, but I can edit that design. And once I've edited it, I can have someone check it, and I can edit it again. And it made it life much easier for us, because we were removing tasks around rework and how that actually led into the industry. Um, other big things, the CD-ROM. Suddenly, we didn't have to have floppy disk and restrict ourselves to 1.44 megabytes of data or if you're Greg, a little bit smaller than that, at under a meg. We had the capacity to capture large quantities of data and then transfer them between teams. We had the internet. What an invention again. 
let's take the largest library in the world, unstructure it and put it in one place so people can search. Um, but it allowed us to be able to utilize knowledge, history, data from everywhere in the world and access it. So that opened up all of the possibilities that I didn't have to worry about what somebody had put into a textbook, what research had been done that I could go to the library and look for. Suddenly I had the capacity to search the world, search the world for information and understand what that information led to and understand how that information could be useful to me, all from my computer. And we had the mobile phone. So, and that really changed the way we communicate. I didn't have to sit at my desk. I didn't have to be tied to an office location to communicate. If I was on a job site and there was an issue, suddenly I can talk to people. I could phone them up, I could communicate with them outside of a two hour drive or going back to the office and making a phone call. So the way we communicated around a job site significantly changed just with that one device. And when we talk about that device, who doesn't have one? Does everyone have a mobile phone? So I'd say pretty much they do. We look at today's mobile phone, 1.6 billion transistors, all in that. 1.4 or slightly higher, slightly lower, depending on brand, gigahertz of processing speed, which means this phone will give me 3.36 million applications per second. It can handle 3.36 million instructions every second. And we put that into context. This phone has 8,000 times more memory, a clock speed that is 32,600 times faster, and can process instructions at 120 million times faster than the computer that put man on the moon. So this one phone has more capacity than NASA used to get a rocket to the moon. And that's where we are today, without looking at the future, without looking at what's coming. So if we look at our industry, some of the transformational changes that led to where we are. We evolved from a drawing board to a CAD station. We also evolved from a telephone to a mobile phone so we could communicate. We evolved from specifications and libraries to the internet so that we could actually go and look up the latest data and the latest information, latest policies. Governments were putting information up there for us. Tenders were being submitted online. We evolved from a fax machine to email. So we didn't have to worry about waiting for that fax to arrive with all the instructions of what we needed to do, I could email someone and know that they were instantaneously going to get it. We also evolved from a mobile phone to a smartphone. So not only now could I communicate on this device, but I could check my email. I could take a photo and send it back to the office. So it opened up a whole range more that I could do just around that construction site. And we evolved from a CAD environment where we were interested in geometry around lines and arcs and circles to an era where we moved to BIM and we were interested in objects and materials and properties and specifications because that's what drove how we were building and that's what drove what was important to us around estimating, constructability, how a project went to, to uh, site. So what really happened is we evolved from an analog thinking to a digital thinking, all in one industrial revolution. One of the key factors around the third industrial revolution was that it was very process driven. If we looked at the drawing board to CAD, we looked at how we worked and how we produced drawings and we replicated it to start off with and we came up with new processes. So we had a process drove a change. Technology enabled that change for us 
and then people had to embrace that change for it to be successful. And it was in two capacities that we went through that. So we had an evolutionary change, which is we took the way we worked, and we replicated it, and we smartened it, and we digitized it, and then that led to some improvement. And then we had paradigm change, which is where we took where work was completed and physically shifted it. So if we look at the area around BIM, and that's exactly what we did. We moved where effort was completed on the work site. Everyone talks about RFIs in construction and needing to minimize it. My answer's always be, been, I don't want to minimize RFIs, I want to move them. I want to move them from the construction site to the design teams. Because if they can coordinate, check, inspect and ensure that once I go to site, everything is controlled, everything is right, then I know that's going to drive a benefit to me on the site. But that's sort of where we stopped when we moved to Industry 3.0. It never really made it to the job site. We never really looked at what we needed to do to make construction smarter. We looked at what we needed to do to make design smarter. And that's why the fourth industrial revolution is going to be really important to us. And it's interesting that when we look at construction in terms of all sectors, construction is the least digitized area in the world. Now, I found that quite surprising when I went through this data. But it was a reality that we've been very good in design. We've been very good in design at actually using technology to assist us, using all of the tools available to us to drive some change. But as soon as we got to the job site, we take a piece of paper, we take our drawings, we get a string line, we get a level, and we lay everything out by hand. And that's how we've worked, because that's been successful, and because we've had no better way of doing it. And I think that's why we are the least digitized sector in the industry. And it's something that has to change. We're going to find over the next 100 years that the rate of buildings that are required just to sustain the human race is going to outweigh the number of graduates, the number of construction people that we have available. So if we don't optimize, this isn't about a reduction in workforce to save cost. This is about a reduction in workforce that will drive us to the future by utilizing them with tasks to fulfill the requirements for us just to be able to sustain. Trillions of dollars that are required in infrastructure spending just to support the growth in the global economy that we can't do today because we can't produce projects fast enough, we can't build them fast enough, and we don't have enough people to deliver them. And that's what leads to all of the bottlenecks and frustration that people have, because we can't work fast enough. So what are the key drivers around the fourth industrial revolution? Well, it was really interesting that the World Economic Forum, again, had discussed this very topic and looked at what are the key drivers of the fourth industrial revolution that are going to have an impact on us? Robotics, artificial intelligence, the internet of things and connectivity, autonomous vehicles and self-driving, 3D printing, not just for people playing and creating a little cube, but for actual physical building elements that can be used as part of the construction process nanotechnology and actually linking in to using technology in, in breaking down the way that it thinks, biotechnologies and being able to produce new materials, not just in medical but for the construction side as well, and quantum computing, where now we're not dealing with one processor, we're dealing with a global processor that handles everything for us. If we look at where we are today, and then we look at everything that's going to be available to us in the future. The question is, what changes are we going to drive? How is this going to help us build a road, build a building, tie everything together? 
because this is where we're going to be. This is our generation and what we have to live with. It's very interesting. This was a slide that was presented at i2Weld last year about the viewpoint of what the industry will look like over the next sort of five, seven year time frame. And everything that the World Economic Forum were talking about really relies, resides in this list. From being able to have software as a service, making access to everything available, augmented reality and the uh, IoT being established on major projects, from prefabrication and pre-construction through to using 3D printing as part of that process in driving the way that we get materials or we use materials on site. The use of drones and drone monitoring and having the regulations that support that so that suddenly we can actually be truly mapping design versus built. Self-guided machines. Some people will argue that that's already happening and I agree. But self-guided machines being a norm on a construction site. And that's just not infrastructure projects. I saw a very interested self-guiding bricklaying machine. You basically program the wall, it would go and lay, the, lay it for you, right? So it's not just about infrastructure when we're talking self-guided machines. AI, being able to manage its first project. It will make all of the decisions for you. And actually be able to drive those decisions to ensure that you are getting an effective project that is on time, that is on budget. Autonomous machinery, guiding construction, and actually doing its first complete project. And then less people for manpower and the rise of the new technological era. So that leads to some substantial change in our industry. And I thought that this slide was a really good viewpoint on that perspective. So when we step into the fourth industrial revolution, What's key to us? What's key to everything that was up on that list? From the World Economic Forum and from other industry insights. The key to us is data. If we don't capture and use that data effectively, then we're not going to be able to drive the future of construction. Because any time we talk about things like AI, self-learning, generative design, this all links into data. And that's what becomes key to us because historically if we can capture what we have and then use that for making better decisions in the future, then that's going to change the way that we work. So if we want to drive change, let's be accurate with data. Let's utilize it. I know there's quite a few people here that are from the developer side and contractor side. And it always surprises me when I sit down with large contractors and developers and say, how do you know what issues you've had on your project? And most of them are, it's, oh yeah, well we have a spreadsheet or it's this or that. And I'm like, what if somebody phones you with a question? And they're like, well if I can answer it, I answer it. And I'm like, and then do you record it? No. It's only things that lead to an impact on time. But that data, even if it's a phone call, because it's a question, if we track that, then we can avoid it in the future. So our big drivers are how we capture that data, how we store that data and make it accessible, how we use the data, day to day on the construction side, and how we analyze it. And from an industry, data requires a few things. We need standards so that data is in some form of structured format because unstructured data becomes confusing to us. We need specifications that help us drive what that looks like. We need schemas and we need structure. And these are all the things that us as an industry are going to have to go through, support and adopt through the fourth industrial revolution. So when we look at it on a construction site, and all of us have probably got something very similar to this where we have our phases, we talk about the information. We've all been really good at focusing on graphical information, the stuff we see. Is it pretty? What's my building? What's my infrastructure going to look like? 
And that's really important to us. But we've never, ever put the same emphasis on non-graphical information. And our key driver, because we're fairly good at graphical information now, is what do we do with this? What do we do about estimating, construction coordination, clash detection, scheduling, all of these core on-site construction tasks that we're not really managing well? And how do we utilize that in the future? And that's where our key driver's got to come from. Let's not focus on all the graphical information that we have now. Let's focus on the data that's important to us in driving a systemic change across the industry. It's really interesting when we look at construction. And I think William Shakespeare captured sentiment very well when he said, all the world's a stage, and we are just actors as part of that. For the construction industry, I think we need our own mantra, which is, all the world's a canvas, and each and every one of you that's involved in, a con in construction is driving an urban sculpture for generations to come. We look at things, Sydney Opera House, Taj Mahal, the pyramids, all of these urban sculptures that people will travel the world to see. And that's the legacy that we want to use. That's the legacy that we want to leave generations to come. We don't want to build cheap because it's square and it's a box where we want to build cheap. We don't want to build boring in a square box. We want to be able to have urban sculptures that people find attractive, that people want to live in. This is about urbanization now as well. But what we have to look at is how does that drive? How does everything that we have available now help us to do that? Through connectivity, system integration, cloud computing, internet of things, mixed reality and AI. There's all of these things now that can help make our urban sculptures far more attractive than they were a hundred years ago. And the thing is, we can now design it, cost it, test it, be inside it, and then build it. And that's focusing, you know, as we move beyond BIM and into digital twin, and actually really focusing on the aspects of what is driving us as part of that industry. But to do that change, there's something that's required, which is disruption. And it was really interesting to me that the third industrial revolution, a lot of people spoke about disruption, and I don't think they understood it, because change isn't disruption. And it's interesting when we look at what is our motivation for disruption in the industry. Studies have shown that waste in construction sits at 57%. That's all waste between material and labor. That's a staggering amount. Over half of the work that we do is waste. And we compare that to manufacturing, where waste is at 26%. Still not great, but twice as good as construction. So what would happen if we could change the construction industry to sit at the same waste as manufacturing. What would that do to a project? What would that do to the time, the schedule, the bottom line in dollars? That change from 57% to 26% in construction would equate to an 18% improvement in project profitability. If anyone doesn't tell me that 18% on a project is beneficial, then bye. You don't need to be here today because you're not going to learn. That's what we have to strive for. We have to strive to systemically change the, our mindset to get to that, though. So let's look at some of those disruptive business models. And they're all where they go outside of the norm. Uber, a leading taxi company in the world, they don't own taxis. They don't own infrastructure. They own a network, and they connect that network. Airbnb, 
the largest accommodation provider in the world. Doesn't own a building, doesn't even really, you know, do much apart from providing a network, a network of connectivity between all of those businesses in driving the way they are. PayPal, world's fastest growing bank, they don't have any money. <coughs> they have a network that ties all of those banks together <coughs> so that people, regardless of which bank you're dealing with, can start utilising it. And you have Facebook, which is the most popular media owner in the world, they don't provide content, they provide a network. We're connecting. Everything is about connecting. In our industry, disruption is about us creating our new network, the way that we think, the way that we drive change, the way that we all work together, and the way that we own what's being produced. And that's what disruption means to us. So it's far greater than just delving into, I'm moving from one piece of technology to another, or I'm changing my process around costing exercise. It's around the way we network data and information. It's the way we share, and the way we understand pulling a project together. Disruption to us is gonna be a massive change if we ever wanna get to the type of change that Uber, Airbnb, PayPal and Facebook have driven through the industry. So let's compare that. Automotive industry versus the construction industry. The automotion, uh, automotive industry, digital model. Digital factories that really go through and understand the production line process. Digital debugging. <coughs> where everything is done electronically to make sure that what's been produced is correct, and a digital manual that sits inside your car and tells you the health of that car as you're going forward. We then look at what the construction industry was. We had 2D plans, especially on the site. We have manual labor construction site. We have a very comprehensive debugging process, which means going to site and having a look for any defects. And our as-built documentation is the folder that sits out in the back room that nobody accesses again. And that's our reality. So what do we need to be? What is the impact on the fourth industrial revolution to us? We're already getting there. Digital building models. Not just digital design, but a digital building model that tells me how it's gonna to go together, how much it's gonna cost, does it comply to the specifications and requirements that I have? A digital construction site, not just for construction, for safety and quality, scheduling, tying everything together so that we fully digitize the way we work. A digital debugging system so that we don't have to rely on a manual process of someone finding something wrong but we'll be notified if something's wrong. And then a digital manual, so that all of those operation and maintenance and facility managers that sit out there don't have to rework everything, don't have to rely on 2D and unstructured data. And that's important to us to get there. It's really something that we want to drive a synergy to the manufacturing industry, because that synergy and leading, learning off of their examples can drive some massive change for us. McKinsey actually did a really good study on the construction industry and why it's ripe for disruption. Um, we had to have, have them here today. Unfortunately, things happened and uh, he couldn't make it. But I'd recommend to everybody to go and read this article on why the construction industry is ripe for disruption. And it's really interesting that out of that study, there were five key points. And those five key points are very similar to what we talk about inside the industrial revolution or the fourth industrial revolution. High fidelity surveying and geolocation, knowing where we are and what's being built where and at what level and all of that. Next generation 5D building information modeling 
actually designing for the future, making sure that we understand the impact of cost and time in construction, and especially as we move into lean construction processes. Digital collaboration and mobility, that ability to not only focus on what we're building, but measuring what we're building, quantifying it, making sure it's accurate, and really driving what that means to us to the site. The paperless project, is it ever going to be a reality? I'd like to think so in my lifetime, but I'm not sure. The Internet of Things and advanced analytics, how we tie everything together. If I can get my fridge to tell me that I need to go and buy milk, why can't I get the construction site to tell me that there's a problem? Because ultimately, that's where we are. My fridge is smart enough to tell me if I need to go and buy something, but the construction site can't tell me if I have a problem that ultimately may lead to a major delay on a project, or even worse, that project failing and causing a catastrophe. So we need to be thinking around the internet of things, how we capture it, and the ad analytics that do le lead into it. And we have to look at future-proofing design and construction. That's through materials and methods and specifications and data structure. Actually, how we capture and do that. So I thought that was a really good article that McKinsey put together. And I said, I'd recommend all of you who are going through change and wanting to understand it to go and read that article. So ultimately, that means we're going through a major digital transformation around technologies through 5D BIM, through big data, vertical cloud, mixed reality and virtual reality, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. This is going to be our future. And that's where, you know, I'm really excited with the way that RIB and Microsoft have been collaborating because one of the things that they've put together is that. It's a vertical cloud for construction. It's tying everything together through the depth of Azure, the R&D, through not only technology, but artificial intelligence and robotics, that is making a lot of this possible. So I'm not here to sell to you or to talk about that, but I'm here to say this may look futuristic, but it's a problem that's already being looked at. It's already being solved and it's already available to everybody. So I want to leave you with three questions that I want you to address throughout today. And those questions are, in your organization, what does disruption look like? What does disruption mean to you? And how are you going to support that? You also need to consider how are you preparing for the future of construction? Because you can't turn it on. It's not something where you say, I'm going to change tomorrow. And I know David's going to be talking a little bit later, and I think he will validate that for you with the journey that they've been on. This is not a switch on, switch off. You have to prepare, and you have to invest if you want to change. And then you also need to look at what do you need to do to navigate the fourth industrial revolution? Because if you don't consider that, the fifth industrial revolution is going to be here, and you're going to be a long way behind. So it's important for us to answer those three questions today. And I'm hoping that the lineup of speakers that we have today will really support that for you and give you some ideas. When we have the panel discussion, please, bring those questions, we're going to have a break and a lunch break, talk to us. I've got 20 people here from A2K today, and each and every one of them would gladly talk to you about what does this journey look like. And part of that is because we've been through this journey so many times. As a business, we've been in business since 1986. RIB's been in business since 1969. We've taken people on those transformative journeys through the third industrial revolution. And we already have the strategies to take people through the next. 
So please, talk to our team. They will gladly help you, point you to the right person. And please, maximise today and enjoy the presentations we have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, interesting thoughts about disruption. Three of the examples he used were Uber, Airbnb and PayPal. Uber could have been set up by the taxi industry. Airbnb could have been set up by the hotel industry. PayPal could have been set up by the banks. But none of them saw the opportunity there. They were all disrupted from outside, even though each of those three, taxis, hotels, banks, they knew more about their industry, they thought, than anyone. My point is that if disruption is coming, it's better to be part of it rather than to wait for it to happen to you. How could your industry be disrupted? No one knows more about your industry and your business than you. So I would suggest you're in the perfect position to work out how the next wave of change is going to come to the construction industry. And before someone disrupts you, before someone implements that change upon you, implement it yourself, just as the taxi industry could have protected itself by setting up, creating and owning Uber if they'd thought of it. One of the, uh, a great example that Andrew gave was the fax machine, cutting edge in the early 80s, now almost entirely obsolete, the one industry, and this is a big worry, the one industry where faxes aren't obsolete is the health system. We had to say, what about kids to a specialist uh, recently? They're fine. Um, her brain's too big. No. Um, but, but so I rang up to make it a point. They go, can you fax us the referral? I'm like, are you serious? Fax, I don't even know what a fax machine looks like. But the, the fax machines are just absolutely rife in the health industry, which um, frankly scares the crap out of me. But hopefully um, they'll sort it out soon. Any sort of uh, change that's going to happen requires lots of persistence, doesn't it? We're talking a lot about big ideas here, but once you have a big idea, there's lots and lots and lots of incremental steps in, in making it happen. A uh, great example is, you know, WD-40, the household lubricant. Do you know, do you know why it's called that? It's because they had 40 goes of it. And after you'd think, after WD-27, you know, the person's boss might have been going, well, is this really going to work? Are you sure? And after WD-36, really, you should be getting back to work. But they knew, um, they knew they had something good, and eventually they persisted and got there. Makes you wonder a bit about the Boeing 747. Um, <laughs> but they persisted there, and I guess they, they got them, that right as well. So what Andrew was saying about data um, dovetails nicely into our next speaker, Dr. Sam McCauley, Senior Lecturer in Strategy at the Business School at the University of Technology in Sydney. His research is all about how organisations innovate, particularly with respect to project-based work in construction, infrastructure and mining. So it's perfectly on point with today. He's going to talk about how construction companies can create more value by using data and how they can ensure that that data is secure. So please welcome Dr. Sam McCauley. Thanks, James. Hello, everyone. Great to be here with you today. Andrew did a great job then setting up the big trends, right? They're unfolding across this sector with the transition towards Industry 4.0. What I wanted to do was switch it from being about specific technologies and innovations through to thinking about how this creates value, especially not just for you and your businesses, but for your clients. Because guess what? At the end of the day, nobody cares about digital engineering. Nobody cares about AI. Right? Clients, if you sit down and talk to clients about something like digital engineering or AI, at the end of the day, they're going to fall asleep. Right? And you're going to be out of the office. What they care about is value. Right? How does this create value for me? So what I'm going to talk to you about today is three different ways I think this shift is going to unlock new opportunities for creating value. Uh, hopefully that will excite you, inspire you. Then what I want to do is conclude the presentation by maybe terrifying you a little bit. Like a little bit. Get you thinking about this shift 
towards data, if your business model is increasingly structured around data, how do you secure it? I've read, I've read all the same um, World Economic Forum's reports, and they're fascinating, right? But at the end of the day, I sit back and think, as somebody spends his, you know, every waking breath thinking about competitive strategy, how am I going to protect this from my rivals? How am I going to prevent other people imitating my value proposition? So I want to talk to you a little bit about some research I've been doing at the end of today, which will walk you through maybe some old new ways of dealing with this. So first up, what do I do? Right? Why am I here talking to you? I spent my life teaching people about strategy and innovation. I'm at UTS. I've previously been at UQ and Imperial College in London. I spent my time doing research in mining and innovation and construction. I've done stuff like design cross-rails innovation strategy. I've worked with some of the largest construction companies and mining companies in Australia on innovation and the management of it. Um, and I sit there writing academic journal articles as well on these topics. And every now and again, I get the opportunity to come out and talk to amazing people like you about what I'm doing and why it's important. So thank you for the privilege. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about, OK, what's innovation? We've talked about some broad trends. What does this look like at the level of innovation? Not just the trends, but at the level. And give you a way of thinking about the different types of innovation that might be possible and how they might compare. Three ways of creating value, some of the challenges, and leave you with some thoughts on disruption. So I think the main thing that's happening at the moment is that we're getting fast, low-cost, high-fidelity simulation, analysis, and prediction. I think if you look at the suite of technologies Andrew was talking about, I think this is one of the main transformations that we're seeing. In the future, I totally agree. I think mass customization, autonomous construction, for now, I think it's all around this. And what does that look like when you get down to individual level applications? I think we can think about the differences here between in incremental innovation, radical innovation, whether it impacts a single function or potentially transforms the v whole value chain. So I'm going to walk through a couple of the examples. We've got here um, with M2, I saw a great example. is real-time safety monitoring by AI, right? Amazing radical innovation. Have an AI out there monitoring your site for things like clash detection. Phenomenal. It'll transform a single function. A case study some of my colleagues have done with Arab, looking at simulation, the use of simulation in fire engineering, and how transformative that is. Right? That totally changed the way the, the totally changed the way the value chain associated with bringing large, tall buildings to market worked. New design parameters, new ways of designing buildings, new solutions. Uh, digital twins. I uh, spent a lot of time looking at this when I was doing the innovation work with Crossrail, working with colleagues like Jennifer White at Imperial College, looking at digital twins. Right? So we're creating these digital twins. They don't just impact, say, the end client or the designer. They've got the potential to transform the value chain, right, right across the value chain. And that's where I've seen a lot of challenges at the moment, where you might get your tier one contractors and your clients who are getting right behind this. But as you start stepping down the levels in the supply chain, these people just aren't equipped to deal with this transformation. Um, some of the big clients have been investing lots of money, uh, trying to upskill their supply chains around this area, but it's slow going. One of my other favorite ones here, we've got generative design. This is an example of a floor plan that's been generated by an algorithm, right? Not humans. You give it a certain number of parameters, what you're trying to optimize, and the algorithm here uh, is built around a biological one, hence it looks a bit like a cell, right? And it comes up with a design that we'd never conceive of, right? Totally different. Now, it's transforming a single function here, right? That of floor plan designing. It's not transforming the value chain yet, right? But one function. So you can start mapping out and thinking about how different individual innovations might be more or less disruptive and where that impact might lie. So the first way I think that these new technologies are going to transform our ability to create value is by these non-human agents, right? We're going to be able to collaborate with with them to co-create solutions that we'd never conceive of by ourselves, right? These, when you've got an algorithm doing your design for you, it's not constrained by the existing mental models that have been beaten into them in university, right? That this is a, the only one way to design a building. This is the only one way to design a mine site. One of the uh, companies I was working with a couple of years ago, they were looking at the transition to uh, autonomous mining. And it took them years to come to this realization that the real value in going autonomous wasn't in, say, reducing the labor force, better fuel utilization, 
it was way back in design. They could change the fundamental parameters around which you design a mine site. If there's no humans there, we can afford to blow up 10 trucks a day because they're speeding down the ramps, right? They fall off and crash and blow up and we write that cost off, right? Because in the long run, it makes sense. But getting that into the heads of the designers and the engineers who spent their lives thinking about what a mine should look like, Right? It's a paradigm shift, as Andrew said earlier, an absolute paradigm shift, right? So I think this is going to be a totally new way we can create value. Another one, stakeholders, right? With rapid simulation, right? High fidelity simulation, stakeholders can work together to iteratively construct a shared representation of value through what are called playful engagement. Okay, so it's very different. If you get around with a client and start playing around what a building's going to look like, playing. Right? What if we organized it this way? What if we designed it that way? All right, let's go for a walk, walk through. That immersive experience that they have is totally different than si submitting tender documents, right? T totally different. It gives you a much better opportunity to tap into and discover latent needs. The amount of times I've had people tell me that clients don't know what they actually want. The client doesn't know what value actually is. This is an amazing opportunity that we've got to discover that by playing with them, right? Sitting down, using these immersive technologies to rapidly prototype, simulate different design changes and take them on the journey with you. So not only are they getting a better understanding of what the value proposition they're looking for in a building is, or a facility, you are, right? The amount of times I've spent going through, doing uh, reviews of big tenders and looking at how the companies have gone about responding to the brief, and they actually haven't really understood what the client was looking for. It's amazing. I did this uh, mining one recently, and this company was setting up to deliver a brand new type of service to the industry around maintenance. And they'd spent months and months and months going backwards and forwards with the client, trying to understand the nature of the value proposition they were looking for. And it wasn't until they came up with a simulation model, right, where the, the client could sit down and tune the parameters yeah, of this new service and figure how it would impact what they cared about here, so revenue, right, and risk of breakdown, that they finally understood what the company was trying to provide. So I spent months on the phone talking, over coffees, over beers, shooting t briefing forms, back and forwards, but it was only when they sat down and played together, using the simulation, that they unlocked what the true value proposition was. So the next one, so instead of playing to come up with what the value proposition is, what this also enables you to do is actually construct a shared representation and justification for radical innovation. Some of my colleagues looked at uh, this deep study looking at Arup Fire and their use of simulation uh, to look at how you go about protecting, designing and protecting tall buildings from attack. So this happened after September 11. All of a sudden people said, oh gee, those tall buildings are looking a lot more risky. Right, so they started looking through how they could redesign the way they thought about tall buildings and how people should be evacuated from them. First thing that happened is their simulation models started telling them that the fastest way to get people out of a tall building is via the elevators. Right, so it makes sense, but it goes against everything we've ever taught. You look up on any elevator, do not use this in case of fire. Right, all of a sudden the models are telling them this, and they're like, huh. well, what would we have to do to make this a safe solution? Right, so they set about creating a design solution where they uh, sealed the, the lift shafts and blasted them out and it would actually be safe. But their big challenge then was, so they were convinced that this was a safe solution, but they had to get the broad array of stakeholders involved in approving a building, everyone from the fire department to the insurance agencies to the clients to buy into this. Andrew has given me an example earlier about talking to some of his engineering students, right, saying, well, if we've got this tiny little screw, right, attach it to a one-ton cement block, we can do the calculations that say that'll be safe. Who out here wants to go and step under it? Nah, not a chance, right? But you know that it's going to be safe. No, don't want to do it, right? So when you're introducing radical innovation, building a shared understanding and a shared justification for why this is going to work is crucial to getting uptake, especially in an industry like construction, which is so complex, has so many different stakeholders at any point who can pull you up and stop you. So actually sitting down with these different stakeholders and letting them walk through, play with the models, interrogate it, make the data transparent, was abs absolutely crucial to them getting this over the line when they, were redes when they were starting to redesign the policy and the design of some of these buildings in Canary Wharf. Right? Without this technology, without this shift, they could not have got this across the line. 
right? Totally new way you can create value. Now, everybody agrees, right, with a shift to 4.0 where we've got these low, low price, high fidelity predictions that the, the value of capabilities involved in human judgment and interpretation, right, negotiated interpretation are going to rise. So things like building those, being able to sit down the client and build that shared understanding of what value is and why it's going to work. What I want you to focus on today, right, is the implications for value capture, right? So an organization's ability to secure data, customize collaborative devices. So for example, the script that your organization has built for generative design and the human resources involved, your ability to secure these assets, lock them down, ensure your rivals can't imitate you, that determines whether you can capture value, right? Absolutely determines it. And there's a challenge to this, right? That these technologies throw up. Every time there's a big technological change, you also not get new ways of creating value, but you get new ways of skirting around the edges and imitating your rivals. I'll give you two examples, one from the evolution of photography and the other from blueprints. So the famous case where with the evolution of photography, right, so all of a sudden you could actually have lightweight cameras that took highly accurate photos. DuPont had a challenge, right? They've got these big industrial plants in the US, they're off there making amazing industrial chemicals and they've set them up in a very specific way to optimize their performance. What did their rivals start doing? Flying over their plants, right, with their cameras and taking a shot, right? How do you protect from that? All of a sudden, something that you would have had to go and poach an employee, bribe them to get the design of what your plant looked like, your rival can, can now fly over and have a look. Yeah? One of the approaches I've I saw on Crossrail um, to protect, because this is still a challenge today, right? So you've got uh, Hockteeth. They've got a patent for the way they launch their TBMs, right? So they patented the technology, but they also want to try and protect other people uh, from replicating the process. So what do they do? They put up a big sheet around it. So all the rivals out there with their telescopic lenses, right, can't sit out there and see how they exactly go about launching this. Right? So that's one of the challenges they were dealing with. Another one um, is uh, Charles Babbage, the inventor of the computer. Right? Sat down, designed this world's first computer, the difference engine. Right? One of the ch challenges he had with this, he was a bit afraid. Right, that somebody was going to come along and blueprint his design and then replicate it, run off, and beat him to the market. So, he devised a very clever way to protect the data that he'd codified. It's a technique that's been used for, by cartographers for as long as anybody can remember. What he did was sabotage his blueprint. He built in tiny imperfections into this blueprint that only he knew where they were. So if you come along and you copy it, you know, control C, and you run off here and try and replicate it, you're going to run into big problems. And this is what the Science Museum in London found years later when they tried to build his difference engine based on the designs that he'd left behind. They just kept running into all these problems. They're like, why, does, why doesn't this work? It should work. And they went back to talk to historians and they said, well, actually, this is, was a, quite a common practice for people like him in that era to protect it from rivals. So amazing new opportunities, right, to be able to sit down and easily copy a blueprint. So imagine before when you had to sit down and redraw a blueprint by hand. But then a whole suite of new risks that come with having to secure that data from rivals. The way we normally do that, and the way we think about it in strategy research, is three mechanisms, right? So economic, so we talk about complementary assets. Do we have anyone from Lang O'Rourke here? No, excellent, I can talk shop. So Lang O'Rourke's a great example of a complementary asset, right? So they can get out there and they can talk to you till they're blue in the face about the importance of digital engineering, modular production, producing in the factory, right? They actually have a factory, okay? That's a complementary asset. So it's very hard unless you've got a factory to compete with them when it comes to this, okay? So we say, right, they might steal your blueprints for how to modularize production, but can you compete with the factory that they've designed, okay? So economic mechanisms which can prevent people from imitating your value proposition. Legal, I'm sure we all know about that. Patent, trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights, employee conduct rules. So for example, you know, you can't go work for your rivals within six, without having six months of gardening leave. Social, these things you may be less familiar with. Really big uh, area of research over the last few years. So essentially social norms, how different communities enforce norms about what you can and can't steal. Uh, two examples, French uh, chefs looking at Nouvelle Cuisine very strong norms about 
what you need to do if you want to imitate somebody's recipe, right, and then sell it in your own restaurant. If you go against these norms, you'll be excluded from the community, nobody will hire your apprentices, and nobody will hire you. Uh, clown eggs, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of those, but this is an informal system that clowns have created because their key intellectual property is in the, their face paint, right? They don't want somebody else to come up and, with their Bozo the, pound, the, Bozo the Clown makeup, right? It was all of a sudden you got two Bozos the Clown, right? It's very difficult then to sell that to market. They're like, well, I'll go for the cheaper Bozo. So what they've devised is an international system where they, on old eggs, they do their painting and they send it off to the Clown Museum in London where these things are filed away, and if you're found to be infringing on another clown's property rights, you're excluded from the clown community. These are social norms. <laughs> Not sure if you guys have devised a system like that for yourselves yet, but we can talk about that over the break. Now, these mechanisms are becoming less and less effective. Right? Why? Well, with this big shift, we've seen a massive rise in codification replication machines, right? So there's these amazing technologies out there like laser scanners, right? All of a sudden enables you to take a competitor's product or even a competitor's whole site and laser scan it, right? We've got digital files that can be copied and pasted. Yeah, so I was reading a story last night about an Apple engineer working on the, you know, we were talking about automotive earlier, Apple engineer working on the design of the new Apple car, right? What did he do? He went and took a whole range of their internal design documents well, not like this on a USB stick, really, uh, walked out the door and off to one of his Chinese rivals, right? They caught him at the airport on the way out the door. Okay, so there's loads. It's so much easier now to replicate data. If your business model depends on data, how are you securing it? Okay, we've also got, if you're, even if you have patented it, trademarked it, had a trade secret, like uh, you can bet your bottom dollar that Apple does, how do you stop this guy walking out and going to another country where you're, rivals are, because we live in a, a world characterized by global competition, and one of your rivals are, and you, they go and give him or her your design algorithm. How are you stopping that? How are you trying to prevent it? Right? This is a big topic in the US at the moment. Uh, there's been a congressional inquiry, and they estimate $600 billion of IP theft a year. Massive, massive problem. I've got a couple of little examples down there. If you want to hear more about it, come have a chat to me. But it's getting harder. So believe me, it's getting harder to deter your rivals from imitating you. In the digital era, it's so much easier to replicate. So what do you do? Whoop. So an example from mining, right? I was talking to um, one of the guys who heads up R&D uh, for BHP the other day. We worked together previously, and I was talking about this exact problem. So they've invested a huge amount of money in making their mines autonomous, right? So this, for example, involves writing scripts to run haul haulage routes. So all of a sudden, what used to be your quarter competitive advantage here was your ownership of these assets, the knowledge you had on how to run a haul route successfully. Now, it's codified into a software program. Okay, so what stops me hacking into BHP stealing that routine and flogging it off to my rivals in India, China, the US, Colombia, Indonesia. This is something that occupies their minds a lot because they've been investing billions of dollars to come up with these solutions, right? So a core part of their operational strategy now, last step is secure, right? Very focused on securing that data, making sure that it's as hard as possible for their rivals to imitate. Now, how do you go about doing this? I like to go back to history. So my colleague, uh, Dmitry Sharapov, and I have a paper. Uh, he's at Imperial College where we look at some of the old ways that people, we call these design mechanisms that people use for protecting IP. I'll give you a nice example of an Australian company way ahead of its time in the 1990s. They were dealing with this problem. They, had this big, they were leading this big shift towards modular production in boat building. Right? So what they do, this is off the back of the revolution in CAD. Right, CAD CAM, so that what they do is they have a little program, right, that you put on the machine and it'd cut out your modular, your modular boat and you'd stick it together. Okay, so this is really advantageous because it lowered uh, exporting costs, so logistics costs, and also um, meant that you could get around all, sort of all sorts of export import controls. Their challenge was if we give somebody this program, one of our customers, why are they ever going to come back and buy it off us again? 
how are we going to stop them giving it to our rivals? So they created self-destructing software code. So it runs once and then blows itself up. Right? We've talked about another couple of examples about how you could go about putting flaws in your blueprints, how you can go about digitally tagging them. So, for example, the music industry is really advanced. There's a, some excellent work coming out of Victoria. They now put acoustic signatures in music. So you can't hear it. It's below out the uh, human's ability to hear, but you'll then be able to figure out who stole it from where and trace it back along the chain. Right. So disruption. Right? What is it? Everyone talks about disruption. There's been a lot of academic debate over this. The last 15 years. This is an excellent new, new book here by Josh Gans over at University of Toronto. And he talks about it as it arises when successful businesses like yours fail precisely, right? Because in the face of technological change, they continue to make the choices that made them successful in the first place. Yeah? So that's what it is, right? This is where you've got a situation where you've got someone like Blackberry who's totally focused on business customers. They thought the iPhone was a consumer toy. Who's, who's currently holding a BlackBerry? Right. So what a question I wanted to leave you with, right? Industry 4.0 is changing the way value is created and captured. What are you changing? Do you have a chief information security officer? Do you have a strategy for dealing with this? Thank you very much. I look forward to chatting to you over drinks and coffee. Speaker's gift. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. And academics love, love things that look like books. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. That was fantastic. One of the things Sam uh, was talking about is, is when change happens, how do you prepare yourself for it? How do you get people to come on the journey of change with you? Quick example, a Dutch bicycle company uh, did most of their sales online. Their customers were all around the world, so they'd sell them a bike, put them in a flat pack and send them to America or Australia or Greece or wherever. The problem they had was that a lot of their bicycles were being damaged in transit, they thought, what can we do to make the people who are, who are handling our packages, baggage handlers, couriers, treat them with more care? Now, they could have been put a please handle with care sign on it, but people hate being told what to, do, what to do. So instead, on these big packages with a bicycle inside it, they printed a picture of a flat screen TV that covered almost the entirety of one of the sides. They didn't say there was a flat screen TV in there. They just put their pi that picture on it. Doing that changed the behaviour of baggage handlers and couriers to such an extent that damage is reduced by 75%. The point is, if you're trying to get some sort of change up, if you're trying to do, you can create uh, awareness and get people on board for a new way of, for example, looking at lifts during fires, what can you do to make them want to think and act the way that you want them to? Our next speaker is Michael Gerdes. He's partner um, technology direct, director at Microsoft. And he's got a strong understanding of how to help cu customers with a, a broad area of solutions. He helps customers change their businesses by using cloud platforms to increase agility and performance and improve outcomes. He's going to talk today about digital transformation, cloud computing, and how to apply that to construction. Please welcome Michael Gertz. Thank you. So uh, I'm here today uh, basically uh, because over the last three or four years, maybe five years, I've helped move some enterprises uh, into the cloud, which is one of the enabling technologies we're talking about. And uh, today I do the same thing for our partner community, uh, which includes uh, you know, A2K, RIB and so forth. So I'm going to cover three things today. Firstly, our point of view, Microsoft's point of view of digital transformation. Secondly, what some of the underlying capability required to transform is, and we're going to focus on cloud computing platforms and how they aren't all, how they have many similarities, but also they're different. And Thirdly, we're going to talk about some very advanced technologies that were actually on the slide way out there, 
as advanced, but how they can be packaged today to provide value uh, to the construction industry in actually the near term and not way out there in the theoretic. That's good. And I want to start with a uh, CEO study from PwC a few years ago. And it basically generically talked about the case for change. CEO said globally that the top thing that they needed to consider over the next five years was technological advances and how to apply it into their industry. And the interesting thing about that is in the world of uh, Web 2.0 or the fourth industrial revolution, people gravitate towards the term digital transformation to achieve that. But the paradox is that digital transformation isn't just about technology platforms, though that happens to be my area of focus. It's actually, from my experience, very much around people, process, new business models, change management, and enabling technology platforms. So here I had to make a decision in the presentation. We could talk about a lot of the futures and future technologies that, that Microsoft sees. Or I thought about the construction industry uh, and where it's at, or takes a, a more pragmatic approach of how Microsoft sees you can get started on the digital transformation journey, for instance, and some of the steps you can take, and our point of view of what we can provide. So I took the latter approach, and I don't know if that'll uh, be the right decision or not. You can let me know in the break. Um, so if you look at digital transformation and the steps that are involved in it, we really want to demystify some elements of it. And what Microsoft provides is an enabling platform for digital transformation. And we do that. Uh, it's not simple, but the strategy is simple. Uh, in terms of we take our IP or our solution areas, we take core business processes of enterprises, which are along the side here, and we see how we can package those things up to create or augment value for each of those areas, like empowering employees, engaging customers, and so forth. And we are not industry experts in construction. So we run Microsoft, just so you know, as most of you probably do, runs a leverage model, meaning we work with partners to access scale and expertise by industry. So today, I'm here because A2K is the expert in construction and they're one of our partners. RIB produces a platform called M2 that happens to run on our hyperscale cloud product Azure, which we'll talk about as it's a cloud platform. And we also work with advisory firms. Uh, McKinsey's was mentioned earlier. By the way, digital transformation is a journey and McKinsey's is one of Microsoft's chosen partners for that continued journey of digital transformation. Uh, internally, and we also work with systems integrators uh, across uh, you know, large and small to deliver solutions and also increasingly to manage solutions going forward. So when we say we have a enabling platform and in demystifying digital transformation, a de an enabling platform more and more over in this in the, this era is a hyperscale public cloud computing platform. That's, that's basically what that is. And there's a, there's a few of them out there. We have one. And really, uh, the construction industry, I sort of agree and disagree with the, 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 the slider because I happen to know over the last four or five years that many people in this room have adopted hyperscale cloud technologies already for their business processes, but um, also that some are yet to embark upon the journey. So I wanted to talk about a, a, a walking deck of some of the things you think about, because if you go through this transformation, you'll probably end up in the point of looking at some of the hyperscale 
cloud computing platforms. And, and Microsoft has one called Azure. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the things you might want to consider, and Samuel, Samuel touched on a couple of these points earlier, when you consider one of these underlying platforms. And, you know, let's be frank, I'm going to talk about some of the things that, you know, Microsoft is focused from in our, in our platform, uh, but many of these characteristics are general. The general characteristics of hyperscale public cloud computing platforms are that they are massively scalable. They are global. They offer elasticity, so you can scale them up and down. You can optimise costs using them. You can move from CapEx to a more OpEx model in your, your projects and so forth. But some of the nuances uh, in those platforms are some of the things that might be interesting to the construction industry today. And a couple of those, or well, the first one of those is, you know, the breadth of the platform you're considering. So in Microsoft's case, we focus on enterprises, traditionally, and we have a very broad ambition about what sort of compute capability we want to provide uh, to enterprises in this hyperscale platform world. So we offer a platform that covers productivity, collaboration and social, business processes with our Dynamics platform, AI and business intelligence and data and analytics, things like Power BI, all underpinned by as we said, data, data controls everything, a uniform or nearly uniform data platform, a uh, uniform security identity and management platform, and all of this thing we call our Azure hyperscale public cloud business. So why do you care as the construction industry when you're going through this process what sort of platform you choose? Well, you might care about the breadth of capability because if you look on the right-hand side, we're looking at augmented reality, which is something that Microsoft uh, focuses on a lot. And if you look at that, our augmented, our augmented reality solution has value, if, it, if you just buy it as part of a cloud computing platform, but it has more value if you can tie it into some of your business processes. For instance, core business process uh, that you're running. Secondly, your collaboration or your communications platform and thirdly, into your hyperscale cloud platform. So in that sense, you might get incremental value from implementing that sort of augmented reality platform on a broad base of cloud computing capability. The second thing I want to touch on for the construction industry is, uh, comes back to the point that Andrew said about it's, it's early in its evolution, which again, I, I'm not so sure of. And that's because the industry, by definition, has um, operates in an on-premise environment. They often have remote locations. It's often global. And in that situation, it means that not every application is going to be fit for purpose for the public cloud on day one. And I think one thing we've done is think very closely about that at Microsoft and the ability to operate in a cloud environment that can integrate into on-premise solutions, into uh, some of your private cloud or hosting solutions, as well as taking advantage of some of the outrageous innovation that is available in the, in the public cloud uh, platforms. And why that matters is that if you're on your journey of transforming some sort of business process, you might want to be able to run it in some sort of you could, you might want to be able to not just move to a complete born in the cloud model. You might want to be able to consider your technical debt and your assets and how they can migrate over time. The next thing I want to talk about in a hyperscale public cloud platform, and that's all vendors, is the same thing that you have to deal with in your industry. Essentially, business and business to business runs on trust. How do we consider, how do you make, we just heard from Samuel about data theft. How do we make these platforms seem, oh, no, <laughs> let me exclude the same, seem, be uh, trusted 
in terms of the capability they provide for business. Because let's face it, if you move one of these business processes and part of it runs in the public cloud, that means we are running that business or an element of it on your behalf. So the prism that Microsoft looks at like that, and it's very important, firstly, it's global. You need reach. So we have 54 regions around the world. Uh, and what's that mean? We have four data center regions in Australia, all to a uniform hyperscale design, by the way. So I'm not saying we're an outsourcer with data centers. But what that means is if you're operating globally, you may have a remote construction location like the mining industry does. You need to get access to the network quickly and access to a local geography. You also probably have data. Your construction is very heavily regulated. One of the other reasons it hasn't moved to the cloud as quick as others. And you also need things like data sovereignty legislation and so forth to be managed. You can only do that if you have the data residing in country. The second area which Samuel talked about is probably the one that executives talk to me about the most. That is security. And I'll give you a, a Microsoft point of view on this. Every day, Microsoft analyzes 6.5 billion security threat signals across all of our platforms. We use our own technology of big data, analytics, artificial intelligence, and by the way, 3,500 security professionals to take that insight, move it into a thing called security graph, which gives you near real time updates into our public cloud platform. And as a user, gives you real time feedback about how secure you are as a user in that environment and so forth. And all platforms need to do that because that is the trust equation of these sort of platforms. The final thing is compliance. You work in a regulated industry, you cannot move these, these applications if you do not meet the requirement standards of the industry. Now, some of those might need to change, as, as James said, that might need to be modernised, but you still need to consider those. We spend a lot of time, and this is only a slight amount of them on the, on the slide, conforming to those compliance regulations. For instance, in Australia, we are um, certified to protected level for government, and we're the only cloud provider that's, that uh, can work with a uh, top secret data center in, in hosting uh, some of the information for defense and national security organizations. So for instance, if you are building for defense, national security, critical infrastructure, or, uh, or financial services, that might be important. The last thing we want to talk about is the world of the amount of suppliers in the technology field uh, for the construction industry is no doubt large and complex like it is in every other industry. When you're choosing one of these, what I would call almost seminal cloud platforms, you need to consider firstly organisations with a track record of delivering that change through their cloud platform. And secondly, you need to consider an and, and I think you'll see a consolidation, and we are seeing a consolidation in the industry because of this, you need to consider organisations that have momentum because the cost of maintaining one of these global, secure, uh, you know, hyperscale public cloud environments is enormous in terms of the capital and people investment and R&D capability not only to manage the existing services that we're offering to make them better, but as, as all our speakers talked about today, when you're introducing new, we hope to have quantum computing as a cloud computing service one day, but that's a ways off. But all the time we are introducing new services that can, we can augment the platform. And that's an enormous R&D and capital undertaking. So you need to look for a platform which, which has momentum because I think that trend will continue as it powers enterprises moving or transforming their uh, environment. And, and on that point, I wanted to finish uh, with a couple of examples. So, uh, you know, and I wanted to challenge the thing that this stuff is way off out there because it's not necessarily. 
I want to start with health and safety, talking about the combination of AI or artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and something that's very key around hybrid computing that's very important for the construction industry called the intelligent edge or edge computing. And the intelligent edge or edge computing simply means if you have a construction site where you need real-time processing, you don't send every signal back to the, your cloud data center. Some of the processing needs to be near real time. For instance, if you're doing mining assessments of uh, explosions and you need to know if the mine wall moves because you still have people in your mine, like most of them do still, uh, you need that feedback instantaneously. You can't wait for it to go back to somewhere and figure out that the white mine wall moved and that's a, that's a safety risk. So the first example we want to talk about is around the combination of those capabilities. And to give you an indicate, while it's a concept video, um, to give you an indication, today already we're working with engineering services, mining companies to provide this sort of capability or a subset of it, uh, considering things like computer vision of video streaming, analytics of that, connecting to your document repositories and policies to help health and safety. So on that point, uh, let's have a look at the uh, video. As our world becomes increasingly digitized, so does our ability to connect with it. Imagine if you could search your surroundings the same way you search the web. Using existing cameras and advances in AI, we can now find things and people in the real world in real time and take action to improve safety and well-being. When a dangerous spill occurs in a chemical plant, cameras recognize the incident. Information about the spill is instantly shared with the people who need it the most, enabling them to protect other employees from coming in contact with the hazard and clean it up. This technology is also useful in an environment like a construction site, where people who need specialized tools are spread out, sometimes across multiple floors. Using cameras already in place, this technology can identify a specific tool, as well as the closest authorized person who can deliver it, saving everyone time and keeping the workflow moving. The digital and physical worlds are coming together to help make everyone more safe, secure, and productive. And we're bringing the edge of Microsoft's cloud to any device. So that, that example, as I said, a concept video, but the fact that that technology exists in an underlying cloud computing platform, the real example means RIB, with their M2 platform can extend it using some of those technologies to be continual adding functionality without necessarily to doing that, some of that deep engineering itself. The second example we're going to talk about is uh, Digital Twin, which has been talked about a bit today. It's a real life example. Um, it's with an Australian partner uh, that we work with that and a global, uh, global firm, Tyson Krupp, uh, it's a real project. I think it, it's aptly named in this. It's, it's located in the city of Towers. I think that's in Holland or somewhere. Uh, and it talks not only about designing with the concept of digital trim, but how once you've built with that concept, you use the feedback loop and the data to manage the building and the environment ongoing. As an elevator company, we are testing not only hardware, but we are also testing our thinking. For years, there was no change in this industry. With the help of Microsoft and Willow, we are in a different stage. The Willow Twin is our feature platform. We're looking at the whole city and how we can leverage AI, IoT and cloud and bring it into one solution that's robust, safe, it's secure and it's scalable. What Willow does is provide a digital twin replica of the built environment to bring together the static information that's produced during the construction of these buildings and the live dynamic information as well. We're leveraging the Azure Digital Twins platform, the flexibility and scalability that offered. 
The digital twin of the building enables us to do testing in the digital world instead of the real world without doing physical testing. This is the first time that we have a complete building with all the infrastructure. There's over 15,000 live data points on that building. There's over 57,000 static data points and I can find them at a click of a button. It won't be very long before every single building construction process ends up with a requirement to have a digital twin of the asset. The amount of information that we can now capture through the Azure Digital Twins platform is mind-blowing. Data from an infinite number of sources. So together with Microsoft, we will change the built world. So thank you. Uh, that, that concludes my, uh, my, my uh, discussion. Uh, all I do want to say is one of the other things you get with hyperscale cloud computing platforms is a partner ecosystem that builds around them. There's no reason that A2K and RIB can't work with Willow around some of those concepts because they're complementary largely. So um, on that note, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a big book. Uh, morning tea now. You can either go that way or that way and there'll be food and stuff you have at morning tea. And we'll be back here about 11. Opportunity from an education perspective in the same way as Autodesk has done. We've for several years now been investing in that, in that industry because we know that that's going to deliver the resources that the construction, engineering and architectural firms will need to, to move into the future. We're not going to get there by simply using the tools that are provided without a strategy behind it. I was quite buoyed by the fact that, that Sydney, that Australia had a contractor who had that kind of um, innovation and vision for the future infrastructure and strategies of their organisation. And that was really my first introduction to Highway. Highway is our strategy to understand what we want to achieve and drive that through our people across the organisation. There's a series of dashboards that allow us to understand clearly what's going on and they provide a mechanism for our management teams to manage the process for us. It's a different approach. Certainly one of the advantages that Holloway gives us is that we can uh, map out repeatable processes um, and we can, we can basically ensure that through those repeatable processes that doesn't matter you know, where our staff are working you know, within the organisation, whether it's you know, on a project in a particular state or in a different state, whether it's on a large project or a smaller project, reading the data and the dashboards that we're pulling out of Highway, again, you know, they're consistent you know, across the organisation, so everybody can, can look at those and, and manage their projects efficiently. It's exciting for us because what it's enabling us is to respond very quickly to the project-based issues such as cost and time. It's Hanson Yunkin's way of building towards the future. So there are, there are some pretty exciting things that are sort of going on there for a hundred-year-old construction business. But I keep telling our people, don't forget we are builders, not software developers. But in reality, I suppose that the new world order is one of convergence and, and maybe that's where we'll end up. But what should be very clear is, is that Hanson Yunkin has a culture for innovation, innovation driving change, innovation driving improved performance and innovation across the construction of its projects. This is the message and the simple story that we have we have, um, we have developed in, in Highway and, and, what, and we want to sort of take you on that journey today. That journey, that journey starts, um, the catalyst for change for us was back in 2009, which was the building the, uh, the BER, building the, the education revolution. Hanson Youngkin was commissioned as a managing contractor to undertake $450 million worth of work across 300 projects and to have that done in 18 months. And we had to reinvent 
our construction processes and, and our management reporting uh, to enable us to, to, to complete what was a very successful project. And being a 100-year-old company, um, the importance is in capturing that knowledge and transferring that knowledge across to what it is we do across our business. And that's the, that's the challenge that we set for our innovation team in, in 2010 to take that learned knowledge of BER and to start to apply those digital, through a digital transformation process across our business. What we were able to do was to, to um, create a system infrastructure that, which removed the silos within our business of, of data and, and, and the information that, that we had access to and to, cre and to create um, and to digitise our, our analogue work processes. Hanson Youngkin has, has, has been, through its journey, developed some fairly sophisticated work processes, uh, and the, di the digital process of, of, of mapping those was, was, was key to, to what, was, uh, what, what was developed in our system infrastructure. What the Eureka, the Eureka moment was for us, however, was um, it was in 2012, we, uh, we visited an Autodesk University um, in Las Vegas and uh, whilst the, the, the intranet that, that, that we had built, which was replicating the sorts of opportunities that we'd created out of the BER, um, were desk-based desk um, workstations. Um, we, we, did not, um, we did not have a mobile computing platform and, and the majority, everything we're doing is in service of the construction projects. It's all happening on site. So what we saw at, at um, Autodesk University was two things. We, we, we saw, um, we firstly saw that the, the, the uh, what the, the, the BIM 360 plat mobile computing platform could do, and it was in its infancy in those days, and it was a blind leap of faith that we moved into that process. But we also um, got a very clear insight into, in terms of what was happening in the, in the design space and, and the concept of, of, of BIM, building information management, some call it building information modelling, building information management and the, and the concepts that were coming out of BIM and the adoption processes that the, 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 the designers were starting to take up. We found a lot of synergy with, with that concept of BIM, information management and, and what we wanted to do and our mantra was we wanted, uh, instead of BIM for projects, we wanted BIM for our enterprise. And that's, and that's effectively what we were able to create. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a technical, technical person by any means, um, but, but this represents the architecture of how we manage our information. And, it, and it's, it's really at, at three levels, the, the, data, the data level, uh, at the bottom, which, which, which really, as we, we break down our silos, the information is collected across um, t um, standard servers, cloud-based computing solutions, um, mobile, um, mobile um, platforms, and, and whatever other access we gain through open APIs to other digital tool sets. We, we wrap that into... Um, the infrastructure tier, was, which is effective, effectively our integration engine, um, where we, we, we bring all this data together and for the purpose of um, reporting on specific work task activities uh, across our business. This effectively captures, in very simple terms, um, how, how we now uh, manage our information. And that's effectively what we what we had developed by, by 2013 uh, and, and what we started to run through, through, our, through our business. I, wanted, I, I now want to sort of step, step you through, dig, take, a, take a, a bit of a deeper dive in, in, in terms of, of what, um, what Highway represents for us. H Highway is the, the Hanson Youngkin platform that controls and integrates structured data across our projects and across our business. It, it's quite simple, really. Um, as some of the previous speakers said, it is about data and, 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 and data management. But what, what really does that mean? Um, you know, it, it's, it, it combines our project processes and the information that we collect out of our our, our, our project 
processes and, and rolls that information, rolls that data up to, a, um, to an enterprise or a business level um, where we are, we are utilising that, that data to, to manage the risks and improve the performance across our projects. If we, if we drill down a little bit deeper and perhaps just, just understand um, the, project, the project processes, uh, it's, it's, a, it's effectively about integrating with a whole range of, of um, digital tool sets. Where does, where does this data come from? It, it, it comes out of the, the, um, um, uh, the, the, the array of processes that, that are undertaken in, in projects uh, and, and it's collected through, through various forms of digital tool sets. You, 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 you may familiarise yourself with some, some of this is to do with Reddit, Re Revit and models, some of it's to do with um, Power Aster Project and how we utilise 4D, um, others are, uh, um, systems that, that we've developed for, for, um, for, for our quality and, and, and safety systems management built on the, the, the BIM 360 platform. That's where the, that's where the data is, is collected, it, it's, it's collected at its source on, on site and, and there are some some characteristics a, a, a about how how we deal with information at, at from our projects. It, it needs to be obviously mobile in, in, in as much as the, the projects are um, wherever they are and, 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 and we're, uh, we're not setting up a, a, a separate infrastructure system for these. Um, we, we need to be working with digital, uh, with, with repeatable work processes and that's particularly important in terms of how we manage our safety on our projects and how we manage our quality systems on our projects. Um, but it's not only in those two areas as well, I mean we, we, we've now driven it into how we program our projects and the reporting that comes from it. It's location based and it's location based in terms of how we capture data and, and particularly in the use of, of, of 3D um, BIM models um, and, and how that information is, is utilised back into our construction activities. It's intuitive and it's efficient. But the point of all of this data is, is, is for what purpose? Um, it, it, it effectively, the, the, purpose, the purpose of collecting the data is, is, to, is to understand and manage the risks that we have in construction. Um, and in doing that, continue to improve the performance that we deliver for our clients. And, and we do that, we, we, we do that now, um, having collected the data through uh, our project review teams, reviewing and drilling down into the, into the re report formats that, that, that get rolled up and, and, and presented to these teams. And, and this, this these dashboards that this is a, a, a project dashboard. Um, you can see the name of the project at the top. This is a this is a this is a real life uh, project. Um, but but, but the, the key points in in, in in this is we we understand where that the, the, this information we're we're looking we're looking at, at the safety aspect uh, on on this project, and we understand that the, the source data is BIM 360, and it's producing this live information from site. It's, it's, if, if we move that into, into cost, then the, 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 the cost database is coming out of CHEOPS, which is our financial services system, which is server-based, um, and, and it provides rolled up um, information in, in accordance to how, how we um, review and in, interrogate the, 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 the data. So that, allow, that allows our teams to, um, to, to drill down in, into, to, to access all sorts of information, visual and, and non-visual, and, and to drill down into the performance of the project. So, so it's, 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 very, it's, it's very simple in, in, its, um, uh, in its conception. Um, it's driven around our vision to look at um, continuous improvement to capture knowledge out of the best of our projects and to translate that best of into our normal work processes. But it's important to remember that the tool sets that we utilise 
uh, is really only part of the puzzle and that the whole, the whole journey really is, is as much about the challenges in empowering people to sort of drive the outcomes that produces further change in our business. Let's unpack that. Um, there, are, there are four pillars to our implementation strategy. Having, having the tool sets and having the infrastructure to drive it, it's still, we still need to implement it. And we need to implement this across a construction business that's doing, 100, that's doing in excess of a billion dollars worth of work. The four pillars that, that in terms of how we implement or ha how we decided to implement this um, are, are about changing mindsets or people, model-based workflows or, or how we digitise processes, driving outcomes or managing performance. And the fourth, the fourth uh, uh, pillar is, 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 is very much what we call the enterprise strategy, but it's, it's, it's about process improvement. Uh, and it, it closes the loop and, and, and really um, um, uh, is, is the best example of, 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 of being able to, to, to do exactly what we set out to, which was capture, capture and transfer knowledge. If we, if we drill down into each, each of these and we, we talk about changing mindsets, people, it's all about people. Construction is all about people, good people. Um, but but the construction, our construction business is not built by by young um, graduates, it, it's, it's built by crusty, uh, crusty old construction managers. Um, guys, guys who know how to pull concrete, know how to you know, sort of fix Rio, know what waterproofing problems are, um, and, and, and they're the guys who are passionate about what they do. Um, the, the culture within Hanson Youngkin is, 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 is one of, 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 of respect for the business, uh, and the importance of, of how we bring these guys along the journey, marry them up with the, the, the bright young digital natives that, that we have in, in terms of um, uh, young graduates uh, who, who enable these guys or activate the, uh, the, the, these dig the digital tools that we're providing for these guys across their work sites. So it's important it's, it, it's, it, it's very important in terms of our people strategy. Um, it's, it's, it's built upon respect that, that our crusty old guys have with our, our, our young people and, and, it's, and it's built upon educating and training um, all of our people in, in, in the direction that we're heading. Um, changing mindsets is, is certainly not easy, um, but it, it requires very clear vision and, and direction and, and we mandated a number of things. We, we mandated models across all our projects. We mandated the use of, of models. So, so from our crusty old construction guys' perspective, they needed to get on board. Um, but, but not only get on board, we, we gave them, we, we didn't force them into the solution, we, we, we gave them uh, a digital native and said, here you go, these are the guys you've got to work with, respect them because they're going to help you. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll come and look at some, 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 of, some of those, those things. But, but training and education is very important. To, to, to keep innovation smart and, and, um, and, and, and online, um, we, we have a number of connections across our businesses, our six states, um, with universities in each of those states. And in New South Wales, we've, we've, we've partnered up with UTS. Um, but but it, it's, it's, it's also uh, having clear vision in terms of what's going on in construction and empowering people to, to understand where things are going and, and, and to give them the opportunity to take on these new challenges within, these, within their projects. And, and that's what we're finding, certainly with, uh, with our young grads, and, and we employed 18 young grads um, this year in New South Wales, 50% of them female. Um, but, but, but they are very, they're extremely, extremely smart, extremely switched on, and we've got to allow them to, um, uh, to, to, to start to think about how they can utilise what, what it is we're doing. The model-based workflow, um, the model-based workflows. Um, that's probably the, the, the central area in, in terms of how, of how we structure and, and, and organise our construction activities. We've, we've heard, um, um, you know, the, the move to BIM and, and um, BIM-based models. Um, what that, that the opportunities that that starts to to, to present 
but effectively, I mean, the, the, what it does is it transforms the, the opportunity to, to utilise 3D information on our, across our sites. Um, we, we are now activating information through, through models um, and, and, using, and, and using those models in our normal work processes. But probably the most important area where we're seeing lots of, uh, lot, lots of new innovation coming, it's certainly in the pre-construction and, 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 and reporting process. Um, if, if, you, if you look at some of the, the, the tool sets that, that uh, we've been able now to activate with it, you know, the use of drones, and this is again a, a live project that we're constructing Western Sydney Performing Arts Centre. Um, we, have a, we have a one year out grad whose, whose role it is, is to point cloud capture the site every, every week. Uh, we, we, we then run weekly reports across, uh, marry that point cloud up with information that we collect off uh, our 4D construction programming and, and, and track milestones. Um, um, you know, th there's, 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 there's a whole range of, 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 of new opportunities that, that, that these young guys are, are bringing into our, 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 um, uh, our projects. But it's not, it's not one project, it's, it's all our projects. Um, so this, this project is the inner city high school, um, just, up, just up the road. Um, again, the use of point cloud drones um, to, uh, in, in, in this case, capture, uh, capture a whole lot of uh, information about that building and how we, uh, and the construction planning ar around that building. Um, we, we, we won that project it was not, it, it, we won that project on, on how we approached and tackled the problem, not on the price. And that's probably one of the first, the first times in the Department of Education that's happened for a long time. But if, if, we, if we then sort of move into driving outcomes, what, driving outcomes is about how we, how we utilise the data uh, and for what purpose do we, do we utilise it. Uh, again, this is, this is this is the Western Sydney Performing Arts School project team. All of those guys are, are digitally savvy. They all drive the models and they, they utilise the models for their day-to-day -day construction planning. And what, 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 what is it that um, information that they, they, they get to access? Um, let's you know, it, it, it's, it's not only the, the access we, we, we get is it's, it's not only about dashboards, but it's, but it's also about visual data that's coming from site as, as, as well and, and, how, and how we can utilise that, that visual data. But let's, um, let, let's start to sort of drill down a little bit in terms of the, 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 the dashboards and um, uh, you know, what's important in, is, is that the digital, the, that all of this information comes from, from a digital source. It comes out of our actual workflows. They're doing what they do, and the, and the information gets collected, and it's transparent. It's not having to fill out a report. It's actually undertaking a task. The information, as we've said, is 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 now all linked, and and, and as a result of that linking, we can we we can provide automated reporting formats. That, that, that information is available at a business level. We have six business units at a state-based level or at a, at a corporate um, level, and, and it, is, it is all rolled up. At a project, at a project level, um, we, we, can, we can drill down into, we can understand the performance of any project and we can drill down into any aspect of, of this project. This, this particular um, for, format, you, you can start to see that there, there's, there's a range of, of, of libraries in terms of how you access. Um, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at a corporate dashboard. You can equally go down and drill into the project and look at the, 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 the detailed information of, of, a, of a project. So, so how, do we, how do we use the information? I mean, the information is, 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 is used for process compliance. Um, in, in this instance, Task, task observations, the number of task observations that we've, we've set across the, the, this project, the toolbox, the number of toolbox meetings that, that, are, that are undertaken, these all become um, uh, embedded in our work systems in, in terms of, of, of what we expect our people to undertake and, and, and we, we get clarity in terms of how that process is going. 
but it's, all, but it's importantly, it's also about setting performance indicators. What is, what is, what is best practice in projects? Um, you know, we, we, we establish in some areas that's easier to distill than others. In, in safety, there's a whole lot of industry standards in terms of, 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 of what those benchmarks or, or, or performance indicators are, and, and we can track and, and record a, a, across those. Um, where we are now in terms of two or three years on in terms of collection of data, we, we are starting to develop um, a whole range of, of benchmarks that we can, we can start to, to, to use across the projects in terms of what is, what is best practice cash flow for a project of this size? What, what, is, what is best, pro, um, you know, how long, what, what's our start-up processes like? There's a whole range of information that we, 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 we now have opportunity to collect and, and, and can, can start to, to drive key performance indicators across our projects to continue to improve. So, so effectively, the implementation strategy um, is, is, is really about changing mindsets, having clear vision to, to what it is we're, we're, we're doing, being very clear about how, how we can develop repeatable processes and, and particularly um, the, the work that is being done in, 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 the, in the model based workflows and, and the digital tool sets that, that um, we're now starting to use. But, but importantly, it's for what purpose? It's for driving outcomes. It, it's, it's, for, it, it's for driving outcomes and, in, and managing our risk and, and driving project performance. But the, the, final, the, um, the, the, the final pillar is, is, is really, um, it, it's, it's, it's about, how we, how, about process, in, process improvement. Oops, sorry. And the, and the process, um, the process improvement is, is across all our work activities. But we're just looking now at, at, at one of those, and we look at how all of that rolls up. Um, but if you if you if we start at the if we start at the bottom, um, the, the integrated tool sets that we use across safety, a, a whole range of, of um, uh, processes and, and data collection points. Um, that that information is 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 rolled up into in PMR, what we call. Um, project management review dashboards. Um, we look at project KPIs um, that is interrogated by our construction managers and our, our business leaders. Um, again, that is that is that is rolled up in terms of, of compliance and performance drivers across our business. Where are we going with LTIs across our business? Um, what is the reason we're not getting there? Uh, and 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 those pro those process drivers start. We can start to look at. Um, you know, root cause analysis and, and process refinement. Um, that then finds its way back into our structured data systems. We revamp the, the, um, the, the tool sets as necessary um, and, and, and we've captured, captured those learnings. So in, in, in summary, we started, we started this journey as to how could we develop the best out of an extremely successful project that, that was starting to utilise um, workflow, digital workflow processes, and and how could we implement that across our business? And and that's that's really where we, where we are today. We we have now captured a, a business intelligence from from an integrated system, which now informs the decisions that we make at at at, at at all levels within the business. So perhaps in, in, in closing, let, let, me, let me say at a, at a personal level that the challenge, the introduction of, of digital technology in our construction business has been and, and continues to be exciting and I have no doubt that, that, that we will continue to drive improved efficiencies and improved performance in how we deliver projects to our client. And again, there is, there is no doubt that innovation and the process improvement that can be brought with all of this will certainly drive transformational change across our industry. From Hanson Yunkin's perspective, we've looked to develop our own protection against that disruption 
by developing our own systems and embedding those into our people and into our processes. Thank you. I'm not quite go back today. I realize I could have actually, but. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you, uh, A2K team, for putting us together here. I think we've had, a, at least for me, fantastic morning. Um, seeing the broad trends that shape society and construction, and uh, then uh, some of the specific examples uh, in terms of uh, people, processes, specific technologies, strategies, uh, ways of thinking about that. Um, so hopefully I can contribute to that. Um, I want to pick up on the question that Sam left you with. It says, what are you changing? What are you going to change? And as you heard from James, my recommendation is that you're going to change how you make your predictions. And that may sound kind of esoteric, especially uh, if you, uh, you know, know this famous quote from Niels Bohr, predictions are difficult especially of the future. Um, but the reality is that your success depends on the effective allocation of your resources. Uh, kind of obvious, I, I, I know. But if you allocate your resources effectively, your business will be successful. So on what basis are you allocating your resources? You are allocating them whether it's materials, labor, equipment, you're allocating them on the basis of a prediction. You make a cost estimate, you make a schedule, you, you pick a particular construction method, you pick a particular design, and you sort of say, that's the best bet we have, that'll perform the best, that's where we should deploy materials, that's where we should deploy our resources. So therefore, we should be able to say in 2019, how much better are our predictions this year than they were last year? So I'll, I'll show you a few strategies that we have found that are effective at making better predictions that hopefully will help you uh, become concrete about making this change that uh, Sam suggested. But let me tell you just a little bit where I'm coming from, so maybe I should have thought of it that. Um, I grew up in Switzerland, as you may have detected from my version of English. Um, as we were building the house I grew up in, like every customer, we had client of construction. We had slightly more wishes than budget. Uh, so my father, who you see installing things there in the right, uh, on, in, the, in the picture on the left, the person on the right, um, had us children work on the house over the weekend. I was 11 at the time, and so he asked me to do something on the, on the top floor, um, and then uh, so I did it, and I called my dad, I forgot what it was, and I called my dad and said, okay, dad, I'm done. And then he looked at my work, and he says, you know, it's okay, but you know if you had used a particular tool, and again, I forgot what particular tool that was, if you had used that tool, you could have done a higher quality job. He says, yeah, I know. Well, then why didn't he use the tool? Well, the tool was in the basement. And, you know, having to go from the top floor down to the basement was a little too much to ask. To fetch a tool was too much to ask for an 11-year-old, right? So I just did it. And to that, my dad replied like this. He said to me, you are an idiot if you're not using the best tool possible. So now you know where I'm coming from, literally, uh, where I grew up, but also, you know, this stuck with me. Uh, so I'm always looking for the best tool possible. Um, I hope that what we've shown you today helps you with where you're going to pay attention. I have had uh, the fortune to work quite a bit with Robert Bergelman, who's a professor of strategic leadership at the Stanford Business School. And, um, he has developed this strategy diamond framework and it has some big academic words in it, but basically what it says is you have to, as leaders of if your enterprises, you have to decide what you're going to pay attention to. I'm suggesting improve predictions. But of course there's many other things you can do. That needs to be in the context of your strategy, what you say you do, and what you're actually doing. 
and in the context of what you capabilities you've got and capabilities you believe you will need. And hopefully today we've been able to show you capabilities you, we believe you need in the future. You know what you say, you know what you actually do, you know the capabilities you have. And so hopefully we've been able to help you by flashing out the top part of this diagram, this diamond, to then figure out where you want to pay attention. Because obviously you cannot do everything, but you have to do something. So as I said, your success depends on the quality of predictions. So why do I say this? Who here has to deliver your projects fast? Only two people. Okay, wow. Well, maybe I should move to Australia. It seems like a leisurely, uh, leisurely environment. Seriously? Oh, yeah, oh everybody is too tired. <laughs> Who, who has to deliver car projects at low cost? So a few more people. Okay. Generally, at least in California, people say we have to deliver our projects fast and we have to deliver them low cost. Maybe the environment here is different. Who here faces, who here has exactly the same amount of work every day? Anybody here? Most of us write the workload, the work that's available varies. Who here has exactly the same number of workers, the same supply every day? But again, most of the time, very few people. So if you put all of this together, right, we constantly, every day, we have to match our supply and demand. Because if we don't match supply and demand, we cannot be fast and low cost. If you read a little bit in operation science, this is like a law of gravity. We know it usually wins. It's very expensive to go against gravity. Similarly, it's very expensive to go against this law of operation science. And uh, so therefore, we have to make better predictions. Otherwise, we cannot reduce the variability that creates this mismatch between design, between demand and supply. Okay, so we found three strategies, and if you know others, please tell us, but we found three strategies which I'll illustrate with uh, quick examples to make better predictions. We found that when you look at more options, we call it virtual buildings, you have a better chance of finding the one you really like. This is kind of like when I look for a Christmas present for my wife. If I look at 20 options versus two, I have a better chance of finding the one that actually will be the right one. We can learn more from the past. By looking at more buildings we have done, we can learn something and make better predictions of how things might turn out. And we can improve the quality of the analysis and simulation models. Right? Every prediction has some kind of formula behind, some algorithm, and we can improve those algorithms. And then we can make better predictions. Usually, of course, you can employ all three together. Um, by looking at more real buildings, you might be able, the things you've done, you might be able to learn something about what parameters really matter in your analysis that allows you to make more, look at more virtual options, compare them against your real buildings and so on. Obviously you see it's just a little bit of data involved, as you will see. So let me take you through these examples. In our industry, right, we, every day we put together this amazing patchwork of supply chains. But every step has engineering, fabrication, some form of fabrication, procurement, delivery, installation. And because of the law of gravity, you know, we typically have to build things from the ground up. So you have from, from, from site work to foundation, structure and so on, we complete projects with this patchwork of, of supply chains. If we actually mapped our organization boundaries, uh, contract boundaries on this, we would be kind of surprised if we were choosing to hold up that mirror to us. Um, but let's see what happens if you try to improve the engineering of the structural system, say. So just one step, kind of a single function improvement like Sam talked about. So typically, you might follow a process like this. You select the structural type, select the uh, topology of the structure, design primary members, select the rest of the member sizes, detail. The problem with that is 
as you come to the end of this sequence of steps, you might find problems that cause you to go back and redo something. We see a lot of digitization along the way. Every step is now, in most organizations, pretty much digital. But that's really just digitizing the cow path, as I call it, or it's called. Because with the computer, if you really use the computer, we can just parallelize all of this and do it together and avoid these really negative feedback loops that cause mismatches in supply and demand. So if we do this, we, we were able to do this about 10 years ago with sports, Arab Sports in London on the design of the truss of the soccer stadium. Um, they wanted to explore the use of computational design optimization, which is now much more common, but 10 years ago that was pretty good. Um, you'll see, I think this is still not a bad result. Um, and um, they had one of my PhD students, Forrest Plager, um, who had worked with them before, come back for the summer. They said, we finished the trust design and we've done an awesome job because we have looked at 39 options, found a trust that weighs 2,700 tons, spent about 200 hours, four hours per option. We don't think computational design optimization will do much better than that. So what did Forrest do? He took that process, right, that was digitized step by step, put it all, connected it digitally, put it into an optimization environment, which you could just buy from the aerospace industry, and then let the computer vary the truss design, make it a little deeper, pick these different kinds of members, and just see uh, what kind of uh, trust design would emerge along the lines of, again, what Sam showed. How did this turn out? This engineer and the computer, it wasn't just the computer, it wasn't just the engineer, it was really the two together that created the system, found a trust that weighed 400 tons less, 20% less steel. That was a big eye-opener uh, for everybody, uh, that you could improve a good design by really good engineers by that much. You know, 12,800 options instead of 39, three seconds per option instead of four hours. So then people quickly, about the same investment in total time, but the difference is 150 hours in creating the systems, system 50 hours of running. And that's kind of the bottleneck, right? That initial investment. But then people quickly pointed out, Martin, that is very nice. You've just optimized material cost. We have also equipment, I mean, fabrication and direction cost. It took us eight years for a company to trust us. Oh, I should have said, yeah, kind of the, the the insight for me was that I wouldn't want to compete with an engineer that's using tools in a connected way if I am working in a, you know, still sequential, digital but sequential way. So it took us eight years uh, for a company to trust us enough to give us fabrication and direction data. But now we could optimize over the whole, right, supply chain for our steel structures. And so let's, let me just quickly show how that turned out. Um, just comparing two very simple structures, just to give you an idea here. Um, on the left is the weight optimized structure with the data from this particular fabricator and director. And on the right is the um, cost optimized structure. You see on the right, far fewer members, each color is a different member time, far fewer connection types, right? What was the difference? Again, you may have different data, then the difference would be different, but Basically, the cost optimized structure weighed 8% more, was 13% cheaper, 20% faster to get. So I'm a big proponent, as some of you may know, of integration and getting people on board early, but then the pushback I always get is, Martin, how do I know I get the best price? And uh, how do you get the best, well, if your competitive bidding can give you 13% cheaper and 20% faster, you should bid. I'm not sure you can. Other, then you're better off bringing all the parties together and just optimize. So I should have titled this, uh, this slide after Vincent Churchill. You know, however strong your beliefs, occasionally you should look at the data. So illustrating what you can learn from the past. This is an example from electricity sector because we have yet to find in six years of really trying very hard to get good data from, from uh, 
consumption companies. So here we were able to get 66 million consumption days from PG&E, our utility in California, somewhat infamous these days. Um, and we were curious about how are people using electricity. PG&E said, nah, you don't have to do this analysis. We know that everybody in California uses electricity like this. Peak in the morning, bigger peak later in the day. As we analyzed these 66 million consumption days with machine learning algorithms, we found that indeed 14% of the customers used electricity that way. They believed everybody was using electricity that way. So the other 86% had 199 different patterns. We're showing here the most prevalent ones. So the data can give you some surprising insights. So that's a, a nudge to, to, to uh, use more data. Um, the last example I want to show here very quickly um, is uh, using better underlying models to create um, better predictions, in this case, construction schedules. Ever since we created the first 40 model in 1993, we loved it, but we wanted to automate its production because we found it annoying um, to make. So similar kind of sequence of steps to make a schedule, uh, but again, you might not like the, the date you end up with, and you might have to choose a different construction method and do it again. Again, you can parallelize all of these steps, uh, make, them, make them in a computer. Um, we did this in a workshop with a team from Skanska, Poland, for a 30-story high-rise in Warsaw. Where they came, we used a, a tool that came out of my research group called Alice. It's now a startup. They wondered which of these formwork systems and which of these zoning sequences is the best. We were able to tell them after a three-day workshop that um, the RCS system was always slower but cheaper. They had actually believed the other way around, but we, we sent them home with this insight and we could tell them exactly how much formwork they needed for each of those approaches. Now, how did we do that? Over the three days that we spent with them, we created 341 schedules. We optimized 65 of them. We uh, really studied 24 of them. On average, it took us 10 minutes to reschedule the whole 30-story tower. Because, again, we used the computer to do calcs. Um, we had simplified the Revit model. That took two days. And we had entered the recipes, how they build things, and then connected the two. That plus the knowledge of gravity allowed the computer to just create lots of schedules. In reality, there is millions of schedule, millions of ways in which you can actually build a project, which we never have ways to explore. And that's what the computer did. And so whenever we ran a schedule scenario, uh, a 4D model was created automatically. And then the construction guys on the team immediately could see a problem. I'll show you uh, these kinds of problems. So here we are uh, sitting in the lab, in our lab at Stanford, uh, with three interactive screens um, used uh, back and forth, so they could quickly see the construction guys, oh, you know, uh, we are rising with the core too much, too quickly, uh, we don't like it, um, so let's go back to the recipes and change the rules that make the schedule not change the schedule. This is a key insight, right? Don't change the information itself, change the system that makes the information. That's a big mindset change that we have to have. We saw we forgot some activities, they could easily be added, we saw a safety issue in using cranes in two adjacent zones at the same time. These are just illustrations of the kinds of scenarios that we were uncovered and then fixed in the recipes, so they got applied and ironed out for good. So in the end of the three days, we sent them home with not one schedule, which they normally would make in three days, but with four schedules, actually four scheduling systems that basically parametrized the schedules for those projects and insights in terms of what they could gain in terms of time and cost. Um, the original sequence versus some alternative sequencing, lots of additional resources, uh, just the right additional resources over time. Where does it fall in terms of time and cost trade-off? So um, I hope with these examples I was able to show you um, in the first example, just, well, in all examples, we looked at many, many more options. In the electricity examples, we looked at what can we learn from the past. And in the last scheduling example, behind the scenes is a better scheduling engine than just critical math path method or just location-based scheduling. 
So with that, hopefully I was able to convince you that you should think about how you can optimize the allocation of your resources by making better predictions later this year than you're doing now. Thank you. Can you convince me? Definitely. I'm totally convinced. Um, okay, now we're going to have a panel session. We're going to get some stools uh, up here. Um, your questions are welcome. We, we were going to run, a, we're running a little bit over time, so we'll run a bit shorter than, um, than normal, but uh, more than we were originally planning to. But we'll still aim to finish everything up and have you um, getting to lunch. And apparently there's a bar outside by 12.30. So if you've, uh, if you've got a question for, um, for one of the speakers or perhaps for the group of them, get your hand up and let us, uh, let us know. If I can just suggest that um, <clears throat> you try and make your questions, you know, reasonably pithy. So if it begins with, well, you know, when you were talking, it made me remember something we did 18 years ago. And I'll just tell you quickly about that. That's not good. Um, just get right to the question. So uh, sometimes it's, uh, people tweet them in, and when people tweet questions, they're really pithy. But um, <clears throat> we tend to, you know, want to attach a long story to it. The question is good. OK, so guys, come up. Have a seat. Might just move them back a little bit so I don't fall off the edge. So nobody falls over, Jake. Yeah. So they're all the people you've heard from. Um, welcome them all back. <laughs> you remember all those wonderful, familiar faces. Uh, quick six, we don't have much time. We're, we're going to get half an hour panel into 15 or 20 minutes. Um, let me just, uh, while you're, you know, working up your bravery, have we got raving mics? We have. People with raving mics, if you don't mind coming to the front so everyone can see you, just put your hand up, we'll get one to you. Can I just start with, um, uh, with one for all of you? What is the most important thing needed to drive change in the construction industry? Who wants to have a crack at that? <coughs> I think you should go first, David. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I provided one. <laughs> uh, I, um, from, from Hanson Youngkin's point of view, it's, <coughs> it's people and how you engage with people and having, having a, a clear strategy for them to follow and then lead them. Yeah, great. Short, succinct, to the point. Anyone else? Anyone want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Martin. From my uh, work around the world, sustained leadership. Uh, I don't see enough sustained leadership uh, from the top and middle management uh, to drive change and learn from project to project. Yeah, Andrew? Uh, I think it comes down to um, structure. So you have to have a really defined structure around how you deal with it. Um, ad hoc chaos doesn't drive change, it drives confusion. So putting some structure behind the change that you're trying to drive. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, you got a question? Yes. G'day. I'm Glenn from squiz.com. Um, my question is, how long do you think the, it'll take for the construction industry to sort of get to that level of automation that the manufacturing industry has, where the built environment or the building site and uh, the built environment is technically considered nearly as a product um, under you know construction and management inside a manufacturing process. Let's have a go at that. <laughs> well, how long's a piece of string, I suppose? Mm. Um, what What is interesting is is that uh, there, there are there, there are some businesses that, that are that are a little bit like Langer Rook, um, where 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 they are self performing, um, and and the best the best way to get there is through self performance. Um, and, and by that I mean um, build it yourself. And, and if you're building it yourself, then you, cha you, can, you can change the complete structures um, and, and, and you, you, you've, got, you've got control of the manufacturing process. The, the problem with all of that is understanding why we don't all do that now, and it's about risk management, um, and we defray the risk to others. Um, so when the cost equation gets to a stage or you're in control enough of a project, um, where, where, where you can balance one off against the other, and then, then you'll start to get a, a shift. But, but um, um, it's happening in some places in Australia, um, in the residential market where you're getting re repeatability, let's say. Mm. Um, and and um, but that market's just about to tank. So, <laughs> uh, <coughs> and I think it's important to understand that 
like this is not exponential. Like we can, we can never continue to infinitely evolve. Like eventually there's gotta be an S in this curve somewhere that things slow. And I think manufacturing is hitting that point that they have evolved so quickly that eventually there's gonna be a slowdown. Um, but what we're seeing is we're on the cusp now of construction where we're just breaking into that realm of rapid growth. So what you're going to see is as manufacturing innovation slows down subtly, not greatly, um, we're in that steep curve. So I would say, you know, definitely within, by the time I retire, <laughs> there will be some good innovation that's come through. So that leads to a related question. Uh, what are the biggest barriers? I mean, when Martin or, or David or any of you really made the case, then I think, I'm sure a lot of people think what I was thinking, well, yeah, duh, of course, we've got to go down that way. What are the things slowing progress? Is it, is it technological? Is it people's uh, ability to handle change? What do you think? Seth? Money. Uh, I think the way that a lot of uh, firms in this sector have set themselves up uh, is in such a way that it's very hard to have the slack resources required to invest in innovation. Yep. Um, so you know, I know Hanson Young, <coughs> my colleague Julie Jupe, who was in the video, and I've always been amazed hearing her stories about how you guys have actually been able to do this. Langer Rourke's another good example. How have they been able to consistently, it's not like the last year, it's like a 20 year journey they've been on around innovation, investing, 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 investing. Well, that's, guess what? Who's behind that? Ray O'Rourke's behind that, right? He, he's got control over the company. He's not, you know, hostage to the stock market and the short-termism that can actually uh, generate. So I think it's figuring out how you, given your business model, can allocate enough resources required to experiment, to play, to invest in this sort of stuff. We, I mean, we, we're a 100-year-old business. Uh, <coughs> I'm fourth generation. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we have a mindset about looking to the future. We invest. Okay, so money's one barrier. Any others? I think risk aversion is the other one. Yeah. Um, especially the construction industry is driven by um, construction managers, project managers needing to deliver projects on time um, and on budget. And they get risk averse at the thought of a new process that is going to destabilise status quo. Um, so anytime you destabilise status quo, then it adds risk to a process and they don't want to be the burden of that risk. Yeah. Okay, uh, money risk, anyone else? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's interesting because you've said the earlier before the der moment, James, like, yeah, you do. I could have expressed that more eloquently. Yeah, so it's very eloquent. But the, the thing is you do have to get some basics right. So, for instance, I was talking to some gentlemen in the break and they said a lot of mid-sized construction sites, small sites, don't have connectivity. They, like they pump in the water and the thing and they don't, they don't put in a connectivity platform. Uh, manufacturing, it's easier because generally it's centralised. But you have at your access pretty much the same technology resources to be able to solve the problem. But there is some simple things. Often we look at processes and, and the simple things <coughs> have been forgotten. So you do need to have some sort of connectivity process which might come down to money and Mm. or infrastructure to set those things in place to allow you to access. But then there's everything else, and which I'll leave to the experts. Uh, quickly, I think it's the hero culture. Yeah. The what culture? The hero culture. <coughs> when we get to a post-heroic construction management, we will have a different industry. Mm. Uh, and that's where productization comes in. And we see some examples around the world. Take Goldback in Germany, take uh, Buchlook in, in Sweden, take Clark Pacific in California. They have very much pursue the product strategy, mm. and they're very successful, and they are just embarking on a real digitalization strategy. It'll be really interesting to see in a few years when they have actually digitized their yeah. product strategy. So, so do you almost mean it's an ego thing in that, why should I, uh, if you like, outsource all my experience and instincts to a computer? Is that what you mean by the hero? No, we, we reward solving problem, not avoiding problems. Mm. Oh, I see. So just, I'll just elaborate on that. I've heard a good example of that once where people were talking about maintenance engineers, right? And they're asking them, why don't they... We, we know there's these, all these ways we can stop these bulldozers breaking down, right? Why, don't these, why aren't these guys going out there and implementing them? And this guy turned around, innovation manager turned around and said, like, this guy's whole identity, his whole life, he gets up in the morning because he loves fixing bulldozers. Right. You know, project managers <laughs> often love running, running at the machine gun, saving projects. Yeah. And I think that's really the point that uh, Martin was getting to there was around this heroic image that Heroes. project managers have. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. a, a project never looks as good if 
everyone sitting in the office yeah. and everything <laughs> is running succinctly. Yeah. <laughs> you must have too many people in the project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Sure, yeah, that's um, the problem. <laughs> yeah. Question over here. Thank you. Ian Hardcastle, Jacobs. Uh, hi, thanks for a great morning presentation. Just a quick question. I think we talked about a low maturity in the sector about knowledge about how to deal with data and the data that's actually there and be able to draw insights from. Are we seeing that is there a risk that there's a, a short term while people are taking that data with small sample pools of data and making big extrapolations and putting big expectations in what the data is going to tell them? Um, there is, I look, this is my view again. I think there's always a risk when you break into that. Uh, I know, I'll, I'll bring back to the example when I was lecturing. Um, and it was just on the cusp in engineering that we're moving into computational design. So we had people actually then going into technology and starting to analyse, um, use that analysis to make decisions. The first thing that I did was actually drove them back to a manual process to validate. So I think is having a small sample size will work if you also have a validation process. Mm. And then the more data you have, the less rigid that validation process needs to be or, or the, the, the shorter time frame that validation process needs to be because the sample size is getting bigger. And I think that's the way that it works. Mm. Yeah, I support, I'd support that. Um, but, but certainly, um, I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just at that position where we've, we've, we've started to collect a whole range of data, but um, yeah, the, the, the confidence that we have in, in being able to, to sort of draw conclusions from that and um, we're, we're testing ourselves against right now. Who, who was telling me about making decisions on 70%, not 90%? Was it you? Uh, no. oh, it was you, yeah. yeah. That, that might be relevant here. Uh, yeah, I think, look, that, that, that also gets back to a bit to big company culture. Um, so that discussion was simply you can make decisions, most decisions, at 70% of the, the data because you have the telemetry these days and so forth. Big companies often wait till mm. 90, 95%. And there's certain business leaders that say they purposely like to make their decisions a little more agile and drive that culture, which is a cultural change. Um, I would add one thing to the, the point of, of data, um, and you talked about data and how you analyse it, but if you look at then how you predict against it, which gets into uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning models, I'd be very careful of the bias of data in models. Yeah. So we won't cover this today, but just as a general trend, not necessarily into the construction industry, have a look at artificial intelligence bias yeah. as a topic mm -hmm. to consider that you've got to be very careful about even when you put in a lot of data that, that you're inclusive and in thinking about that. Mm. And that's a, that's a future problem that we're starting to see. Mm. The unanimous nodding across the yeah. panel. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, often have conversations with, with, with Julie about um, you know what? Um, what should universities be educating um, the, their, their construction people around? And, and the, the the concept of a um, um, construction data analyst mm. um, is is coming. Mm. Um, yeah. Every every business every construction company will need to have a construction data. I actually analyst. wanted to ask that question about uh, how does the education system need to change to prepare for the future of construction? That's one way. What are some others? How can you we prepare? Uh, I've got a general comment. So if you look at <coughs> what we're just talking about, which is largely platforms that take heavy computational work, I can give you a statistic. There's 5,000 people being brought out from universities today around some of the things I'm interested in, cloud computings and technologies. We're looking for 20,000 a year uh, in Australia. So there's a gap. So there is a, there is a, a large skills gap and when you get into data analysis and so forth, there's similar skills gaps in our education systems. Private companies are working with governments to try and solve that. Yeah. Anyone else on that? Uh, Changing the education system? Martin, you look like you're yeah, grappling well, with a uh, complex... I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just as an illustration, since I've taught uh, my uh, construction cost estimating scheduling class uh, since 2008 only been based. So yes, the students you hire from me since 2008 do not know how to read drawings anymore. They do not know how to count doors on a drawing, for example. Uh, I mean, I think they could learn it. Because I thought in their career, in uh, 
that is a less useful skill than if they know how to use BIM for scheduling and estimating. And I felt that they would add more to the company by having those skills than one more person who can take, you know, um, a takeoff tool and run it over drawing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll, I suppose that point I made in my presentation about, I think in the next five to ten years, there's going to be a lot more people in the construction industry thinking about information security. Yeah. Uh, than, yeah. than there are today. Uh, you'll see something that looks a lot more like, say, uh, the big banks here with chief information security officers. Um, I think in construction design, built environment, there's going to be a lot more focus on that, about where your data is going and how, making sure you can control it. Yeah. Okay. So, so I made I made the comment in my presentation that we we hired 18 um, grads mm. um, at the beginning of this year, um, and and um, you, you you can see from from how how we're developing. Um, the, the, the purpose of the grads is to partner up mm. um, with with our with our crusty old construction heads, um, and and the, the, what we find is the students that we are getting are technology ready, um, but we I mean we operate across six different states. They are certainly technic technology ready coming out of UTS, mm. but you know we're working with the Australian Institute of Building to to suggest that there should be um, a, 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 um, a defined curriculum in terms of. Um, some of these skills mm -hmm. and, 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 and work throughout universities to, to uh, no, it's, 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 it's hard to get cl um, collaboration out of universities, it's, it's difficult to get it out well, of Don't get me started talking <laughs> about collaborating with industry. <laughs> but, you're all very it. difficult people. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but <laughs> what, we, you know, what we are finding is, is, is that in certain, certain sectors, they are technology ready. Mm. Yeah. And they're not, they're not the old apprentices who provide the cups of coffee yeah. to the site manager. Yeah, okay. They work with them. Um, there's a question here. Yeah, Owen Hayford from PwC Legal. Um, I think uh, the industry, uh, contractors, subcontractors, suppliers clearly have a self-interest in getting more efficient and more productive if only to survive, if not to make more money. Um, but owners and clients are also major beneficiaries of improved efficiency and productivity within the industry because they'll get more bang for their construction buck. And so my question is, well, what, what is it that owners, clients, should be doing to encourage this within the industry and make it easier for the contractors and whatnot to, you know, make the investments necessary to, you know, build this technology and teach their staff how to use it, et cetera? Yeah. So they should take more ownership of their projects themselves. <coughs> um, you can only buy so much innovation. You actually need to participate in it to really get it. Uh, an example of that, uh, I happen to sit next to the uh, uh, manager of uh, data center construction for Facebook on a, on a flight uh, fairly recently. And, and um, he said, this year I'm planning to build $9 billion worth of data centers, but I'd love to build 10. But I can only get resources for nine. And I said, so how you, you know, what are you doing to use those resources well? I said, well, what they're doing is they're, I don't know how often, say every six months or so, bring all of the companies that build data centers for them together and say, everybody here needs to share their best practices yep. and share them with their competitors because we, are, we don't want to pay again and again for the same learning curve. And this is just what you have to do if you want to have a piece of this work. Mm. That's one example. Yep, and right. I've, I've seen exactly that same example in Thailand um, with developers over there bringing their entire ecosystem together. Um, I think another area is that owners need to remove ambiguity. They need to really understand what they want to get out of a project and how they're going to utilise that. Mm. Mm. Um, because too often, and especially when BIM came in, you'd have owners saying, oh, BIM sounds good, I want some BIM, give me some BIM. <laughs> what is that? Like, it, it, yeah. it's so ambiguous. So removing that and actually putting some structure around it, which looks at what am I going to use the data for? What am I going to use this project for? Um, if I go down a succinct path and methodology, what is the benefit to me as the owner? And then articulating that to the ecosystem. Just to build on that point, I think it's being about being really clear about what their business model, yep. the asset is. Yep. You know, that, that's something that I don't see enough of. So no. you've got... People out there talking a lot about delivery models, right? and there's a lot of our time and effort is spent on thinking through the right business model. But then that next step about that, how, how that then links in to the business model, the assets meant to be supporting, 
uh, there's usually a much less clear link between those two things. Okay. I, th I think um, th there's informed clients and there's uninformed clients. Mm. Th there, there, are, there, are, there are clients that are asset holders and, and, and yeah. um, um, g getting an informed client as an asset holder is, 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 is really the lottery mm. uh, and, and they generally um, just move outside the public sector. Um, the private sector, they're, they're few and far between, but, but they, they are emerging. Um, and, and they and they are emerging, um, but but do they do, do they value? Um, they, they need to understand and, and, and value that process mm. as, as well, and and that's 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 very much they're, they're very much at the start of the journey, and um, you know there's, there's there's a long way to go to that. We we find that um, in in terms of being able to build competitive advantage, mm. um, that that um, you've you've really got the opportunity to take client take clients on the journey mm. and show them. Um, I mean, uh, we'd be doing a number of government projects at the moment where, whereby uh, if they could apply some of this stuff across their portfolio, mm. there would be huge wins for them. But, but literally having to drag them kicking and screaming. They see no value, uh, they, and they've, they've said that, they, they do not value um, um, any BIM model on their mm. project. Yep. I think that's, that's the reason why, David, that contracts haven't changed to support an evolution in technology. Um, because uh, there's no concept of value from an owner at present. Mm. And I think they need to understand that. There needs to be an owner's network that gets together. You know, Transport for New South Wales, actually, mm. they're the ones that have probably put in the biggest effort of understanding what they want to achieve, what's the benefit, what's the value to them, mm. and then articulating it to the industry um, mm. so that everyone develops an understanding. Yep. We, we don't see that enough from owners. Yep. They, they need to do that. But it's fragmented as well because there are, there are a number of people who see this as a huge opportunity and they're, pre they're prepared to provide services, be managers here or management services there. And it's fra it, it actually fra fragments what, what's happening out there. Okay, uh, we've got time for one more short, sharp question. Hi, it's Richard Choi from NatSpec. First of all, thank you very much for your presentations. I'd like to hear your views on theory versus practice. <laughs> well, I can easily answer that. Yeah. Um, I mean, what you see, what, what you've seen in our presentation is what we are doing. Yeah. Um, but uh, whilst, and, and it's not an end point, it's just the journey. Um, but, but quite frankly, we would never have even started this process unless we understood um, where this was all going. And I think Andrew's, Andrew, Andrew's um, presentation was probably the most poignant um, in, in terms of, you know, where, where, where that journey has gone and how quickly it's all collapsing. Um, we're a hundred-year-old construction business. We have that 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 corporate memory of where we come from and what we have done. So it was easy. For, it was easy for us. It was easy for us. You will not be able to deploy digital methods consistently without a sound theory. Mm. Yeah. So theory is becoming much more important than it used to be, and we don't yet have all the theories we need to truly leverage the digital tools. And that's where uh, we are excited about partnership um, between academia and companies because it cannot just be that academia's job, it wouldn't be able to do a good job. And likewise, it cannot be your job to develop uh, the theory that's needed for true uh, Industry 4.0. Okay, uh, we're going to have one final question. Go for it. Hi, my name is Alexia Leedis. I'm from Design Intelligence. Um, Martin, I'd like to thank you for your point about bringing industry together and getting industry to share. There's a saying that when the seas rise, we all sail together. It's a little bit incorrect, but you get the gist. That is a big issue in our industry. We're too siloed and that's what's held back our productivity. And so my organisation exists and does exactly that. Um, somebody else made a comment, when will the industry start to see advanced manufacturing head con uh, enter construction? Um, you should all take out your pens. There is a company called Katerra. I'm bringing them to Australia in July. And they are started by two people from advanced manufacturing. So it's happening. It's just not hit Australia yet. Um, there was also a point that Sam made that money... We, we, we are nearly out of time, so if you can is, get to the question if there is one. I'm asking it now. Yeah. Money is what's holding the industry back from innovating in this space and time. So for smaller firms, because I talk to firms about this on a daily basis, they're scared they're going to get wiped out of the market. How do they start on this journey? Thank you. Anyone? Um, with a preparedness to invest. Mm. Yeah. If they don't have that, there's no hope. Mm. Um, so so um, it, it, it's a, um, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
um, and, and, unless, and, unless you're prepared to jump in and have a go, then, then and, and, and you will never, there is no perfect system. Um, so you, you, you need to think about what it is you're structuring that allows for, ch for continual change. Yeah. Um, and but you've got to make a start. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the exact point, Dave, the making a start. It's like if you have limited resource, budget and availability, Internally, you have to analyse your entire business system, not just a part of it. So you analyse an entire business system. And then from that, you will actually be able to establish a return on investment where you would get most bang for buck. And as part of that, you then start working on that piece of your system, um, get it working, get it profitable, and then look at if you can invest in the next part. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing scenario. You need to understand your journey you need to map out an overall process and structure that you want to achieve, but you can implement in stages. And that's important for everybody that are smaller organisations to understand that it doesn't have to holistically be one step. Since you know Katera, you probably also know about Project Frog. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really curious to see which of these uh, fundamentally different strategies yeah. will uh, win in which markets. Is it the, uh, we, con we are full in, in control of everything? but needs lots of money, Katera strategy, or is it the investment light, knowledge heavy, or knowledge intensive, uh, dense uh, strategy that a company like Project Frog mm. is pursuing? <laughs> well, it's a VHS versus beta. <laughs> Always good to end on a cliffhanger. <gasps> what will happen? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank the panel. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the, we can all clear off, but Andrew's going to um, say a few words to Very few words. Up. I know we're behind. <laughs> um, look, number one, I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for coming today. Um, for us, this is the first of many events that we want to run. Um, we're invested in this industry. Uh, we have been for a number of years, and we thank you for your investment today, uh, for being here with us and actually enjoying it. So your feedback is really important. If you've got any feedback around the event, what we can improve, what we can do better next time, number one, love to hear it. Please make sure that you do tap into our staff and the network of people that we have. If you want more information, please talk to us. Remember, we are one solution. We're not the only solution. Uh, we hope that you choose to work with us in the future, and we hope that we can con continue to support you the way that we have been. You know, we have evolved. Um, our partnership with RIB and Microsoft has really changed the way that we think as well about the industry um, and where the industry is going in the future. And we really are ready and want to help you on that journey. So, you know, please, anything that we can do, let us know, work with the team. And again, just thank you all for your time and your commitment to be here um, and for helping us do this, change the future of construction. So, thank you. Oh, we're going to do this now. Are we doing lucky draw prize now or afterwards? Now? Um, all right. So I have three people that I would like to bring up on the stage. So we, ha we have some um, prizes. Just because everyone committed and coming, I want to be able to try and do this. So I'd like to bring up um, Felix and Romit and Ron um, from RIB and Microsoft. So both of them committed to sending people from their sort of uh, main office in Hong Kong, to be here and support us. You know, we've worked really closely with them and spent a couple of days with them. Um, and I'd like to them to come up and actually draw the prizes for us. <laughs> I don't know where the prizes are. Our names in the oh, yeah. So I'll hold on to the prizes and people can draw the names. How about that? And then you can go, go for it, Ron. So this is Ron from Microsoft. I think there should be a raffle ticket and a number. There should be a D05. D05? Black, I think. Black, yes. Grey? Black. All right. Come up. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> there you go, Ron. You can do the prize here. Are we going to keep them around? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> All right. Ramad is the Chief Technology Officer from RIB. So. Hello, everyone. Um, F30, red. A30. Uh, 30 or 20? 30. 30. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. We trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
And I'd like Felix. Felix is a global head of M2 and someone that I've been working very closely with for the last few months. And yeah, like it's been a great journey. So thank you for the invite. <laughs> uh, Red F27. Yes, <laughs> check I'm, check uh, yours, Ron. Is that you? No. <laughs> oh, <no>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just finally, uh, the bar's open outside. Lunch will be set up there in like a, probably about three and a half minutes. Come in and get some. Go out, get a drink, come in and get some. Thanks for coming. See you later. <laughs>